Thank you. Everybody, please, we're going to get started with this program. We do have a long program today, so we want to get started. We want, again, for the, um, for the conversations to be at a complete minimum, so that way those around you can hear what's going on. All right? All right, today's program, for the, firstly, for those who don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and a lot of you have already seen me from different programs, or whether it be on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or somewhere. I mean, you've seen me at different programs. Before I begin, I want to thank our sponsors today. We have a lot of sponsors for this program, and I have to thank them. I want to thank Novartis and QuestCore, Genzyme, Genentech, Teva, Accorda, Neuroscience Consultants, WalkAid, Biogen, Neuroscience Centers of Florida, Infinity Clinical Research, Bionis, and Polar. I want everybody to thank them because without them, Without their assistance, it is not possible for us or anybody else to do kinds of programs like this. This is an MS Views and News program. This is not a program from any other organization. This is a program that we decide, we, we, we put together, this is our fourth symposium, by the way, but we started doing these programs back in 2010. It was February 2010 that we did our first program. Since that time, we've done over 80 programs in that short amount of time, and this year, this is our 22nd program of the year. 22nd program of the year, we still have another 10 to go before we finish out this year. We know that it's extremely important for people to be educated with MS news and information. That's why we have to do these programs. That's why we decided also, as you see, there are cameras in the room, there are lights up here, there are people from all around the world that are not getting the amount of programs that you guys see, not just from what MS Views and News does, but what the pharmaceutical companies do in the United States, it's not done outside the United States. So again, we want to be able to help provide the information and give others the opportunity to be, to be educated with the information that they need to live and better moderate their lives. Um, there are, again, it's just, for those that don't know, I, how I got into this. I got into this because I too have multiple sclerosis. And when I was first diagnosed, the information just wasn't there that I needed. And I belonged to a support group here in Miami-Dade at that time. And the people in the group really didn't know where to get information either. So that's when we started doing it. And I started putting out information that I found on the internet, being internet savvy, I started finding information that different people needed from the group, and I was sending it to them by email each day. That list started to grow. Support group leaders started to find out about the information that I was sending out to just that one little group. And what started off as just sending out something to five people is now reaching people in 97 countries. Yes, it's a great thing. So that's what we want to do is we want to just keep providing further and further information. Without wanting to bore you all today, I want to get started with introducing our first speaker. But again, remember, we need you to fill out those seminar evaluations. And before I forgot, I'm out of line here too. We have raffles. I know you're all here just for the raffles, right? You, exactly. You didn't really want to listen to the speakers. You just came because you wanted to see what we have for you. And by the way, what we have is, you know, we have a book. We have a gift certificate, by the way, to have lunch here at the Intercontinental. We have Neuroscience Centers of Florida donated a free brain scan. So, the lucky winner of that is going to get a scan of their brain, not of their feet. All right, then we have a couple of tablets. And by the way, this program is being broadcast on YouTube. So it's also being archived. So after this program ends, for anybody that's out there and you guys as well, you'll know that you'll be able to watch it when you get home. You could tell others about it. You could see it on there. But again, this is being videotaped right now, live stream. It's not videotaped. It's being programmed right now via YouTube. They agree with what we're doing, and they wanted to help us get out our message. Let's begin. Sorry. I hate microphones. Don't you all know that I hate microphones? Makes me feel uncomfortable. Imagine that. I have to see a shrink for that. Right. So the first speaker we have today is Berta Fonseca. Dr. Fonseca is a board-certified neurologist. 
She graduated from the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine and completed her neurology residency at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. Dr. Fonseca currently practices out of her own office in Coral Gables, as well as the Neuroscience Consultants Comprehensive MS Clinic in affiliation with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and where she is an associate medical director. So, here we go. You're up. Thank you. One last thing, everybody. Each of the presenters, Dr. Stango and Dr. Fonseca, are going to speak for 20 minutes each, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So we'll have about 35 minutes of Q&A. When Q&A ends, lunch is going to begin. I know you're here for that, too. Yeah. So again, let's just get started with this program. You can get into the Q&A, and then we can get to lunch. Thank you. Well, hi. Um, good, everybody. good morning, everybody. Thanks to Stuart for having us here. So we're going to get um, the program started. We're going to be talking about a little bit about multiple sclerosis, some treatment options, and also some symptom management. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I don't... Good. All righty, so first we're going to start off with um, saying or defining what multiple sclerosis is. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic autoimmune neurological condition where the myelin, or the protective covering uh, of the nerves from the brain, the optic nerves, and the spinal cord can be damaged or destroyed. These lesions, what we call the MS plaques, or the areas where the myelin has been damaged, can cause interruption in all the electrical impulses that um, our brain is sending to our different um, extremities and our body parts, therefore leading to potential symptoms and problems related to MS. As we know, it is an unpredictable disease and it varies from one person to another one. No MS is the same as another MS. So we can get different symptoms that can vary from very mild to more severe, depending obviously on the parts of the brain that are affected by the multiple sclerosis. It is not directly inherited, which is something that a lot of people um, are concerned about. There is um, a little bit of more predisposition when there's first degree family members like parents or siblings with MS, but it's not something that is gonna be directly inherited to um, the children of that person that has MS. And most people have a normal or near normal um, life expectancy, so it doesn't alter the life expect expectancy of a patient. The exact cause why MS happens is not known, but it's believed to be multiple factors that have to do with it. Like, for example, a genetic predisposition, um, maybe a viral infection. For example, one that has been mentioned many times is the Epstein-Barr virus, or the one that causes the mononucleosis. And also, is believed also to be environmental, since there are certain people that come from um, northern temperate climates are more predisposed than others. Although we know that we can see MS in, in many places also not just in the temperate climates. It usually develops within the age of 20 to 40 years old, and it's a, it's a disease that is more prevalent in women. There are approximately 400,000 people, patients diagnosed with multiple sclerosis here in the United States. And, as we all are familiar, there are different types. There are four types. There are the relapsing remitting, which is 85% of the people have relapsing remitting. There is the primary progressive multiple sclerosis, which more or less 10% uh, might have. The secondary progressive MS, and the progressive relapsing MS, which is approximately five minutes. As we know, the relapsing remitting, let's see if I can find it here, the relapsing remitting, which is the most common one, is the one where a patient will have a relapse, or a flare-up, or an attack, or an exacerbation, and will recover from it and go back to his or her baseline. And that is the most common one. The primary progressive is the patient that will begin um, having accumulating neurological deficits and slowly progressing, as the word says. The secondary progressive is the kind of patient that starts off as a relapsing remitting, and then with time, they can progress into, they can turn into a more progressive course, and those are the secondary progressive. And then there's the progressive relapsing, which are patients that will progress, but within that progression, they will also have relapses. So these are the four types that we have. 
The most common type, as I said before, is the relapsing remitting, and there is where a patient can have um, exacerbations or flare-ups or attacks. And basically what an exacerbation or an attack or a flare-up is, is a new neurological symptom or old symptoms that recur that last for 24 hours or more and are progressively worsening. So that's, um, for example, such as weakness, numbness, loss of vision, etc. So that is the actual definition of what an exacerbation or an attack or flare-up is. Now, um, within MS, as I said before, everybody has different types of MS and everybody will present with different symptoms, but these are some of the common ones that we can see. Weakness or numbness in limbs, I mean either arms or legs or, or, or both, disturbances of vision, cognitive changes, fatigue, bowel or bladder dysfunction, and also disturbances of walking or balance. Now, related to weakness or numbness in the limbs, we know that that can be depending on the areas of the central nervous system that are affected by the multiple sclerosis. It is one of the most common symptoms, and they can certainly interfere with a patient's life and abilities to do their um, daily activities and also to affect inability to use the affected limb. So that's something that obviously we want to make sure that we get on time and that we treat accordingly. Now, as we know, weakness and numbness in the arm can lead to difficulty writing for those that need to be writing, I don't know, maybe at work. And also even something as simple as, feed, as feeding yourself or taking a shower. We can see if weakness or numbness in the legs um, arise, there can be difficulty or actual inability to walk completely or to lose the lower extremities and is usually obviously assessed by, a healthcare, by your healthcare professional um, during their examination. In a case of a flare-up or an exacerbation or an attack, if that is what's causing the weakness or the numbness and it's something that's acute that just happened, in some cases IV methylprednisolone or solumedrol, which is commonly known, can be treated for that flare-up to recover faster. That's pretty much the only thing that it does. It relieves inflammation and therefore that lesion can heal faster. Those that are intolerant to the IV solumedrol or to the methylprednisolone, then there's other options like, for example, Actergel. Disturbances of vision are also very common in certain patients. At least 50% of the patients will have um, disturbances of vision or what we call optic neuritis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve. This inflammation of the optic nerve could lead in some cases to either blurriness or vision or just complete loss of vision and also causes pain when the patient moves the eyes around. So that's a, something that we know and usually we recommend for an ophthalmologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist evaluation since we need to treat this. For optic neuritis, there is treatment and the only treatment is either IV steroids or the solumedrol or actor gel, which is also approved for the treatment of an acute optic neuritis. Something that is very common and does interfere a lot with a patient's um, life and their ability to work and interact with others is cognitive or what we call memory, right? Memory problems. Thank you. Um, cognition is the process of thought, again, our memory. It can be seen approximately 45 to 65 percent of patients, but it's usually very mild to moderate. Only 5, 10 percent of the patients will have more severe memory or cognitive problems. And disability and disease duration are not group predictors, meaning that not because somebody has more disability than another one will necessarily have to have more cognitive problems. It's really not related. There are certain areas of our memory that could be more affected in MS, and these are the ones that we mention here. Recent memory are the things that we did recently, or short-term memory, the verbal fluency, our ability to reason abstract things, sustained attention, specifically when you have to do multiple tasks or multitasking, and also concentration. How do we know what potentially causes this cognitive problem? It's been related to a greater burden of disease, meaning more, the more lesions there are, obviously we, we, we see by MRI, the more prone that patient is to having cognitive problems and also certain locations make patients more prone. For example, in the frontal lobes, which are obviously very important for our memory and our behavior. Also something that has to do is the degree or the extent of the brain atrophy that that patient might have and the amount of black holes. Also, the more black holes, the more atrophy, the more prone that patient is of having memory issues. 
is very important when we're assessing um, cognitive impairment or cognitive problems to think that there are other things that can potentially uh, mimic or look like, but they're something else, they're caused by something else. Some of the most common ones are depression, which can cause a false sense of having a memory problem. Obviously the treatment is different, is to treat the depression then. Stress, which is very common also, as cause of problems for um, the memory. Fatigue, since it can affect your ability to multitask, it can affect your ability to concentrate. Also fatigue has to do with, can lead to cognitive problems. Certain medications, specifically muscle relaxants like baclofen or medications for anxiety like clonazepam, Sanex, et cetera, those can also lead to um, having cognitive problems and also sleep disturbances. If somebody has, for example, sleep apnea, that can predispose him or her to having more memory problems that versus somebody that doesn't have it. Multiple medications have been studied as treatment for MS-related memory problems, but none of them have really shown to be as effective as we would like. The most important thing is to make sure that you're on a medication that's approved for the treatment of the relapsing MS, if that's the case, and then therefore that is one of the best um, sort of uh, options that we have at the moment. Now there's certain things that maybe you can do that could be of help, like a little bit of strategies. For example, I always tell patients to write everything down, write questions. If you're going to go to the doctor's appointment, make sure that you give, that you write a little list of the notes or, or notes with the questions that you want to ask him or her, because otherwise you might and finish the appointment and you forgot exactly what you wanted to ask them. You didn't have a chance. Have a designated space for everything. Repeat things that you need to remember very badly. Take your time. Make sure that you don't put too much pressure on you because that's only going to worsen the problem. And if you find that cognitive problems happen in a particular time of the day, well, make sure that you arrange your plans around so that you don't have to, so that you can get the most out of that time. Most importantly, if you ever have any problems with memory, just make sure that you tell your healthcare provider he, he or she might be able to help. Another of the most common and more disabling symptoms is fatigue is very, very common, approximately 80% of the patients might have fatigue at some point. It consists of lack of energy, tiredness, or just the sensation of generalized weakness. It could be more pronounced in patients that, has, that they have atrophy in certain parts of the brain, specifically the parietal lobes, which are the two upper lobes here. Those that have more lesions there can be more predisposed to having more fatigue than others. And also other causes such as depression, insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, thyroid problems, medications, vitamin deficiencies, anemias, all these other things need to be excluded. And the treatment, it's obviously depending the cost is the way if it's depression, obviously the treatment is depression. If it's anemia, then we have to work on the anemia. So different, um, uh, different reasons have different treatments, but if the reason is MS, that's the cost of the fatigue, then we have several unapproved treatments that can be used for it. Um, as well, like amantidine, Provigil, Novigil, which I'm sure that many of you would be familiar with them. Now, if you don't want to treat it with a medication specifically, there's little um, tips that maybe could help you. Like, for example, make sure that you conserve energy. Take naps during the day so that you can feel a little bit more refreshed. Arrange activities to do in the part of the day that you feel you have the most energy and then you have more, um, that you feel more energized to do them. Make sure that you stay away from the heat, particularly here. Stay hydrated and eat healthy and exercise regularly if your physician approves and says that you can do it. Another common symptom would be bladder, bladder issues or bladder dysfunctions. There's several types of bladder problems that could be in MS and sometimes even a combination of all of them. Bladder, which is spastic, which has a failure to store, therefore is very small, it's constricted and a patient has to be constantly going to the restroom ever so often to empty it. Bladder with failure to empty, which is the complete opposite. It becomes grow, grow, grows, 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 and then therefore there, there could be some retention of urine. And there can be a conflicting bladder when there is the actual muscle in the bladder is trying to, to, to work properly, but then the sphincter, which is a little muscle that we have, won't relax. Therefore, the patient cannot um, urinate properly. There are several symptoms that could be seen, either frequency and urgency of urination, hesitancy of urination. There can be an inability to completely empty the bladder, inability to hold the urine, and frequent nighttime urination. For that, the best thing is to go to the appropriate healthcare prof 
professional. He or she could refer you maybe to uh, somebody that's more um, versed in that. And then they can do several tests like urodynamics, post-voidal residual, ultrasounds, and hopefully a urology evaluation. Some tips, just make sure that you stay hydrated, even though it sounds um, conflicting, but you need to stay hydrated. Just make sure that you don't sip water all day long because then the more you're sipping, the more trips to the restroom that you're gonna have to make. Make sure that you avoid caffeine since caffeine is a diuretic and take bathroom breaks. There's several medications approved for it, so make sure that if you can use them, maybe they're a good option for you. Another very common um, problem will be bowel, I'm sorry, dysfunction, which we could see either a severe constipation by do, uh, maybe because of lack of hydration, lack of exercise or physical activity, or maybe because of medications and also incontinence of bowel, which also can happen. Make sure that you stay well hydrated. If there's constipation, maybe medications can be of help. Maybe a change in your diet, eating more fiber will help you, stool softeners, and also a bowel pro program, what we call like, right, like sort of training the, the, the bowel to sort of try to go every day at around the same time. And another very common symptom can be disturbances of walking and balance, where a patient can have imbalance, unsteadiness, weakness or numbness of the legs. They feel like they're slow when they walk, they fall frequently, or and some sort of nerve injury, like for example, foot drop, could obviously interfere with their walking ability and make it more difficult for them. The healthcare professional will assess what's really the cause of the walking problem. And in some cases, physical therapy can be of help to maybe do exercises for, for balance and also for strengthening of the lower extremities in the case of walking. Also, in the case of um, problems with, the walk, with your gait, gait training, physical therapy is also available. And in many patients, it's very helpful too. And those patients that they feel just their walking is very, very slow, Ampira is a potential, um, could be a potential benefit if there's no obvious contraindications to it. Other symptoms that we are also aware of, dizziness, difficulty with speech, difficulty swallowing, muscle spasms and cramps in legs and neuropathic pain. Obviously all of them treated differently, speech therapy, muscle relaxants in the case of neuropathic pain, there's um, specific medications also for that. I just wanted to briefly mention um, something, two things that are very um, common, which are the vitamin D which we know it's a, it's a vitamin that's responsible for calcium and phosphate absorption. It's, a, it's mainly obtained through our diet and sun exposure, but we believe that low vitamin D levels are associated with cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancers. And we also know that it's associated with multiple sclerosis. It is very important that that is checked and therefore is that it's low, it is supplemented because it may have a protective effect and lowering the risk of MS. So it's very important for all of us to get that checked. And the other one that's very um, important is smoking, since several studies have shown that if a patient smokes and they have, for example, relapsing remitting um, MS, they could progress into a secondary progressive MS. So we certainly, for those that smoke, make sure that you talk to your healthcare provider. Maybe they can come up with something to help you quit. Now, very briefly, since I know I'm running out of time, I wanted to mention about several treatments that we have. These are all the ones that we have approved up to date, Betacerone, Avonex, Copaxone, Novantron, Rebev, Tysabri, Octavia, Gelenia, Albagio, and Tecfidera. Thankfully, we have many medications approved for the treatment of relapsing MS nowadays. We have Copaxone, for example, which was approved in 96. It's believed to cause a shift with your immune system to throw Instead of throwing inflammatory, it throws anti-inflammatory cells, so it's helpful in that sense. Um, it's approved to be used 20 milligrams daily, but they recently did a study called the GALA where they um, administer 40 milligrams three times a week, so they're currently just awaiting that to be approved. The most common side effects of Copaxone, injection site reactions, lipoatrophy, and also post-injection react reactions. We have the interferons, which we are also very familiar with since they are approved from um, 96, 93, 2002. They're immunomodulators. They take your own immune system and modulate it. They're not immunosuppressed. The exact way they work is not known, but they are approved for the treatment of relapsing MS. They have several side effects, like the flu-like symptoms, depression, injections, side reactions. We have to monitor the liver, the white blood cell count, the hemoglobin, the platelets, thyroid problems, and also they pose a risk to pregnancy. 
There's Tysavri, which is a monoclonal antibody. It's an IV infusion given every four um, weeks. It hampers the migration of cells from the immune system through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. Therefore, if they move through the blood-brain barrier and get to the brain, then they, they can cause the lesions, the destruction of the myelin. So it hampers that. And it is uh, very effective in slowing the worsening of disability, disability and also decreasing the amount of flare-ups. Some of the common side effects, allergic reactions, headaches, they can predispose patients to infections, fatigue or tiredness, depression, liver problems, and increases the risk of PML, which is a massive demyelination of the brain that if it's not caught on time, it can obviously be lethal. Then we have Gelenia, the first pill approved in 2010, sequesters the lymphocytes in our lymph nodes, therefore preventing them from moving into the central nervous system. These are some of the side effects that could happen with gelania, the bradycardia, then it's monitoring for the first dose, increased risk of infections, liver problem, edema of the macula, which can lead to problems with vision. We, we monitored before starting and four months after. And also there was one case of PML in Europe recently. The, the newer one, which is Tecfidera, approved in 2013, March, uh, is believed to have an effect on, on our oxidative stress, therefore anti-inflammatory and reducing the, the amount of re free radicals that are released. It has been used, a similar component, I'm sorry, has been used for the treatment of psoriasis in Europe. So um, most common side effects being flushing, headache, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain. It's taken 120 twice a day for one week and then increased to 240 milligrams twice a day. We have to monitor the liver, we have to monitor the web lethal count and the lymphocytes. We have Albagio, which is the or other oral medication approved last year inhibits rapidly dividing cells, suppresses pro-inflammatory factors, and limits the ability of TMB cells, decreases the annulus relapse by 30%, most common side effects, hair loss, nausea, diarrhea, and also it can be hepatotoxic and teratogenic. Some side effects, as I said before, acute renal failure, peripheral neuropathy, may decrease the web blood cell count, and could interact with other medications. And here, very briefly, we have a couple of things that are coming along and our alentuzumab, which is another intravenous um, infusion. And that needs to be closely monitored, obviously. And rituxan, which also has been used for lymphoma and, and RA in the past, but also they're studying to see if it would help MS. And then last but not least, Empira, the walking pill, for those that have walking difficulties and don't have contraindications to it, is an option, is not a treatment for multiple sclerosis. It's just for walking faster. And the Axer gel, which I mentioned before, um, it's basically for the treatment of exacerbations and optic acute optic neuritis. So as we all know, there's very uh, many things that are coming along our way and hopefully um, show to be very promising, but not only being effective and also safe, since it's super important for us. The questions we'll have, as Stuart said before, a Q&A part at the end after the next speaker. So now I'm gonna pass it, sorry, pass this on to Stuart. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fonseca. Remember everybody that we're using this more like as, um, you know, just to open up your minds, um, you know, little discussions here and there of what it is that, um, that is being discussed or, or what they want you to ask questions about. Because the Q&A is what a lot of you really feel stronger about doing. And by the way, before I introduce Dr. Steingo, I too have MS. I forgot to thank other people, like our volunteers. And I wanted to thank our staff of MS Views and News and our board members for being here today. And of course, I had to thank all of you to actually get up today and come down here. So thank you. And now, I have to introduce a person that many of you already know about. That's enough? All right, it's done. Thank you. I'm going to sing. No. Good morning, and thank you, Stuart, not only for inviting us all here, but for, for everything that Stuart does. I, I think he has done a tremendous amount for the MS community and helped us educate our patients. This is not because I had a meeting with Johnny Walker last night. That is not why. This, this is because it's on YouTube. We have these bright lights over here. I thought this might be better, but I'll take them off. So um, where is the, this is this, let's get started. Okay, so there will be some overlap between Dr. Fonseca and myself and what we say. 
Dr. Fonseca said some things that I'm going to say. I'll probably say some things that she said. Are my slides up there? Not up there yet. I'll keep talking. Okay, so as you look, if you see on the agenda, you'll see that there are multiple topics that Stuart asked me to do. And so each one of them may be, may be uh, quite brief. Uh, some people comment that I speak too fast. Yeah, I, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to slow down either today. Uh, all this stuff, the good news is that everything you see is on YouTube and archived. And I, I thought I'd rather put more information than less information so you can always go back to YouTube or go back to the archives and look up some of the, some of the stuff that I've put up over here. Uh, when it eventually appears. So the first thing I wanted to just uh, give you is my little introductory slide that tells you about all the different aspects of MS, about everything that we could talk about when we talk about MS. We could spend a whole morning talking about exercise, uh, and these are all these different topics, all the different buildings in the land of MS. And so if you look on your top left-hand side, uh, the first block talks about the diagnosis, and briefly I'll talk a little bit about uh, MRI. In the next, on, in the middle on the left there, you see treatment. And in terms of the disease-modifying drugs, Dr. Fonseca has spoken to you about it already. Stuart asked me to say a few words about the relapse. Dr. Fonseca has spoken to you briefly about relapse. I'll say a few more words about relapses. The symptom tower, obviously, you heard about how much time there is for us to talk about symptoms, and we could spend all day talking about symptoms, so that's why it's the tower. And the medical support, social support, self-help, everything you do, and some of the people that are, that are following us that are going to be talking about physical therapy and alternative treatments all fall on the right-hand side, self-help and social support. Uh, those are all very important things that we could spend a lot of time talking about. Hmm. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about briefly is about MRI scans. MRI scans have been a huge advance for us. We've had them for about the th last 30 years, and they're a huge advance for us in diagnosing MS. They help us diagnose MS. They help us assess how active the disease is. If you have a relapse or an exacerbation, the scan can give us some activity about that, and the scan can help tell us about how your disease is progressing. There are studies that have shown if there's progression on the scan, it tells us something about the prognosis. So when we look at a conventional MRI scan, the typical scan that you're going to see in the clinic, uh, we're now moving forward. We have other scans that tell us more information. But in the typical scan, what it predominantly tells us about is the white matter. So you've always heard that MS is a disease of the white matter. But we know very well that MS also affects gray matter. And on the typical MRI scans we see, we don't see a lot of the gray matter. That's going to be some of the forthcoming new techniques that you can see on the very last bullet point over here. In the future, we have new scans that are going to tell us more about MS, about the gray matter. But typically, in the, in the conventional scan, we're looking mostly uh, at the white matter. One important thing is that the scan doesn't always correlate with how you feel. So, for example, we could be doing a routine scan and see active disease, and you feel well. Or you could have an, act, an, an episode, and we could do a scan and it might not show it. So the scans don't always correlate with the condition. Now that one, that one I need, need to work on at night with Johnny Walker. So um, MRI scan view. So this is typically when you look at your MRI scan, so you're sitting in the neurologist's office and you're looking at your scan, and now you want to look at certain things. I don't know if that one translates there, but you'll be able to see it on YouTube. So the first thing you're going to look at, you remember T1, so T1, we look at T1, we see dark spots. And those are what we call black holes oftentimes. And a black hole that's been there for a while is a sign of permanent damage. So if you see more and more black holes appearing, it's not good. It means the damage is accumulating. And then you look and you see that's T1. Now then when you come in, we give you gadolinium. So you go and you can get the contrast. The contrast, it lights up. We call it enhancement. If the contrast lights up, it means that there is an active lesion. That's also in a T1 view. So we do a T1 and then a T1 with contrast. That lights up, it's active. And then finally, T2. So all the white spots that you see on a scan, the typical white spots, you can call them lesions, you can call them plaques, you can call them white spots, whatever you call, whatever name you give to them, those are a sign of scarring. Once they've been there for a while, these are a sign of scarring. And the more you accumulate, the more damage that it indicates. And studies have shown that early on, you can look at the number of white, white spots, and as they start to accumulate, these, these, and this is not a good thing, it means that there is more scarring. So these are the three typical things we're going to look at on a scan. And here I've shown you the scan over here. And you can see on the right-hand side, for those over here, a black hole. And some little black holes over there. I don't know if this goes there. A black hole, black holes over here. So those are black holes, signs of, of a permanent scarring. And then we give the contrast. Typically, when you give contrast, there should be no white spots on, the con on this picture. No white spots. So with contrast, when you see white spots of the contrast, it means that this is an active lesion. 
On these scans over here that you're looking at, the white spots are signs of active lesions. That's the next thing. And then finally over here, this is what we call a flare image. It's the most important image that we look at. And that's a very important image for us to show the amount of lesions. We call that the lesion burden. What is the burden of this disease? And these are called T2 or flare lesions. And there are two views we look at. There's one, this is one view, and then there's also another view that we look at. I want to move on and talk to you briefly about relapses. And so MS in the early stage, when there is a relapse, we understand that a relapse means that there is inflammation. And so what this slide over here shows you is inflammation. In the center of the target, that red spot, is a, is a vein. And around the vein you see thousands of these blue spots. Those are inflammatory cells. Because if you look more toward the outside of the slide, what you see is pink tissue. That's normal brain tissue. And the white, the, the, the red blood vessel in the middle with the blue spots around it is inflammation. And that's what a relapse represents. That's why MS is an inflammatory disease, as you heard before. And what we want to do is shut down this inflammation. Is it important to treat a relapse? You might think it's obvious. You might think, well, yes, you should treat a relapse. And some people have said, well, maybe it's not that important. And maybe we don't have to treat every relapse. What this slide over here shows you is that if you look on your right-hand side at 90 days, that's 90 days following a relapse. And if you add those two numbers together, the 30 and the 40, that's 70%. 90 days following a relapse, 70% of people had some worsening of their disability. So we have a scale that we use to measure people's disability. And three months later, there is still some measurable worsening of disability. And this slide, therefore, told us it's very important to treat uh, people for relapses. Uh, let's leave that one. Okay. So if we don't treat someone, what happens to them? What's the outcome if we don't treat someone? Now, there are some people that are fortunate. They have what we call benign MS. About 10% of people, maybe 20% of people, have benign MS. What does that mean? That means when we examine them, at least 10 years after their diagnosis, they've been diagnosed 10 years, they have MS, and there's no measurable difficulties. They're already, you can hardly tell that they have MS. And maybe you can call that benign MS. How do we know they have benign MS? How, does, how long does it take us to find that out? A long time. Because we don't define that at the beginning. When you start with the MS, we never know where you're going. You could start mild and it could progress. You could start badly and you could settle down. So benign MS, the definition of that is that you have to have MS for a long time. This is something we only determine after a time period. But most people, at the bottom there, most people that have MS uh, have typical, uh, typical course for MS that we understand. And without treatment, in the days before treatment, the Mayo Clinic study showed that 15 years after the diagnosis, if you don't have treatment, 50% of people have progressed. 15 years after the diagnosis, 50% of people have progressed. And 25 years after the diagnosis, 85% of people have progressed with their MS without treatment. That's why treatment is very important. This study was done from Mayo over 20 years ago before treatment. And then there is a very small group there. You see in the middle, about 5% of people have what we call malignant MS. They progress very rapidly. Uh, they don't respond to treatment. Uh, fortunately, that's a very small group. But this is obviously what our goals of treatment are. We're going to talk about, we want to stop the relapses. That's the most important thing. First thing, shut down the relapse. Stop the progression of disability, our most important goal. Reduce the activity on the MRI scan. You've seen before an active MRI scan. We want to reduce that. We want to be looking at scans of that MRI activity. And obviously other things make you feel better. We want to make sure you're taking your treatments. But the goals of treatment, relapses, disability, MRI scans, are always the three things we're using to evaluate you every time in the office or the clinic. Three things we're looking at. Are you having relapses? How's your progression? And are there any MRI scan changes? Is it easy to make a treatment decision? Dr. Fonseca showed you that we now have 10 approved drugs for MS, and I'm going to show you at the end how many more are coming along in the next few years. And how do we make a treatment decision? It's not just sitting in front of you and talking about it. These are all the things that need to come into play. Look at all these things that you need to think about when, you, when we make a treatment decision with you. Is the drug safe? Is it tolerable? Does it work? Is it convenient? What's the cost? Do you have any other issues? Is there a pregnancy issue? Do you have any other medical diseases? Uh, there are, is, what's the personal choice? So there are many things over here that we might have to think about in choosing the right drug for you, and all this is lead, leading us forward to the era, to the time coming forward in the next, hopefully, few years, where we're going to make a personal choice for you. What's right for you might not be right for you. Individualized medicine, personalized medicine, what's the best choice for you? And all these things are going to come into play. And also other things, maybe genetic factors. We might do your, look at your genome, your gene pattern, and say, okay, we can predict from your genes that you're going to respond to this. So we may, looking forward uh, into the future, hopefully be able to predict much better particular medications that you could respond to. 
Talking about relapses, you did hear some information about that previously. The standard of care for relapse is to use solumedrol. The solumedrol uh, is high dose intravenous steroid. It's a high dose. It's the highest dose of any condition that I know of. The low doses don't work as well. In fact, in the original optic neuritis treatment trial that was done over 20 years ago, the people that got high, high dose of solumedrol did the best. The people that got oral prednisone in a low dose did the worst. They did worse than people on placebo. So we know with MS that really the treatment of choice for MS relapse is solumedrol. That is our first choice. Intravenous, we typically use one gram a day. Most people now are using it for three days. Some people use it for longer. But we still, if someone has a very mild relapse, might not use it. Steroids are drugs that have side effects. They can have side effects on the bone. You can gain weight. You can raise the blood pressure. If you're diabetic, it can put the diabetes out of control. Long term, it can have effects on the bones, osteoporosis, cataracts. There are many potential effects of steroids. So we still are considered of using steroids. Now, what happens if steroids fail? Do we have options? And the first one you already heard about was Acthar gel. Acthar gel. You can see from the name ACTH. ACTH is a hormone that is made in our pituitary glands. This is a formulated Acthar. The ACTH obtained over here is obtained from pig pituitary glands. And Acthar actually was approved for treatment of MS relapses even before solumedrol. It was the very first medication approved for MS relapses. But it had some other issues. It's expensive. So we only use it in certain situations. For example, if the solumedrol has failed. You've taken solumedrol and it failed. And some other reasons we'll talk about in a minute. You could take oral corticosteroids. I told you before that a low dose is not what we use. It's not effective. So, if we give you one gram, our typical dose is one gram intravenous solumedrol, to give you the equivalent dose of oral corticosteroids, which is prednisone, we have to give you 1,250 milligrams, 1,250 milligrams of prednisone. Now, you know if you have an allergy or something, you go to see the, the allergist or the ER, they give you 60 milligrams. I just said 1,250 milligrams. There isn't a pharmacist that doesn't call us when we write that dose. The biggest strength of Prednisone available in this country is 50 milligrams. If you need 1,250 milligrams, you're taking 25 tablets a day of oral steroid. That's why we use solumedrol. Then there are other options such as plasma exchange in a very severely ag aggressive uh, case. So why do we need the options? Not all patients respond to steroids. There is a, there's a very large ongoing uh, patient reporting group called NARCOMS, the North American Registry for MS, and they found that about 51% of patients said they responded to solumedrol, so not everybody responds. That's why we need options like Acthar gel. And the time we use Acthar is if the steroid has failed, or if you cannot tolerate solumedrol, it might make sense to you consider Acthar, or if you have poor veins because Acthar is self-injected either subcutaneously or into muscle. Uh, this is the next topic that Stuart asked me to look at, is adherence. So, in the past, now we have pills, and hopefully people will take their pills better than they've taken their injectables. What's the adherence rate? And so here's a study. There was a study that was done in Canada. In Canada, they've got a captive audience because everything is, comes through the national health system, so they know exactly what people take. And they showed a dramatic drop-off, if you look at this over here, within about two years, 50% of compliance. 50% of people are taking the medication as prescribed. A, a marked drop-off. So why do people with MS or with other chronic diseases not take their medications? So this is some of the things that are going to help us do this. Establish realistic expectations. That's the first thing. What do these drugs do? We've talked about this. It reduces relapse. It slows progression. It affects your MRI activity. But these drugs are not a cure. It's important to understand that. The purpose of these medications is they are preventive. They're meant to stop a relapse, stop you getting worse. They don't reverse what's happened already. The damage that's done, the scars that you've seen on the MRI scan is already there. If you have symptoms, this is not meant to take away your symptom. This is not meant to help your fatigue or your bladder problems or your walking problems. You heard about those problems from Dr. Fonseca. We need to manage your symptoms as a separate issue. The purpose of these drugs is to slow down the progression of the disease. So in MS in the past, certainly some of these problems are problems with adherence. People may have been needle phobic and just got tired of taking their needles. They had side effects. They might not always report them. They might just stop their medication. Believe me, we see that all the time. Or a perceived lack of efficacy. I just spoke about that. I'm not getting better. So people say, oh, this drug, this is not working for me. I've been taking drug X for six months or a year, and I don't feel any better. 
So the key thing is you don't feel worse though. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm gonna, they have to find other ways to make you feel better. So a perceived lack of efficacy. And depression is an important thing in MS. So depression is higher. The incidence of MS, of depression in MS patients is high. It's actually higher than in other chronic diseases. If you look at other chronic diseases, rheumatoid, lupus, etc., the, the incidence of depression in MS is higher. And depressed patients don't adhere to their medications. They get tired, they give up hope, they don't take their medications. So depression, another symptom you've heard about before, very important for us to treat depression. Here are some strategies to try and make people adhere better. Good communication, education, yeah, exactly what all of you are doing. Uh, go to other meetings. Uh, Stuff online, keeping yourself educated, having good contact with a physician, with support groups. All these things are very important for adherence. And then Stuart asked me to talk a little bit about some aspects of starting treatment and switching treatment. You saw now we have 10 choices of medications. And how do you decide which drug to pick? We talked before about individualized treatment. And what are some of the things you have to look at when you're starting a medication? So these are some of your questions. Monitoring, what do we have to do for monitoring of this drug? Some drugs are more complex than others. Screening, what do I have to do for screening? Do I just do blood tests? Do I have to see a cardiologist? Do I have to see an ophthalmologist? What kind of lab work do I do? What are the risks and the benefits of these medications? And again, efficacy, does it work? Is it safe, is it tolerable? These are all the things you might look at when you're starting. And then we have to match you again with other treatments. So if you look at some, some patients that are taking medications, think about all the symptoms we've talked about before. You could be taking something for your bladder. You could be taking something for fatigue, for depression. How many different drugs could, could you be taking? And then you might have other conditions. You could be diabetic. You might have other conditions. You're taking a whole bunch of medications, and we need to look at all of this. What other diseases do you have? What kind of interactions could we have? These are all things, and this slide is going to be there, so I'm not going to look at the details of it. But these are all the considerations we have to think of when we put you on a medication. All the other diseases you could have, heart disease, thyroid disease, depression, infections, other autoimmune diseases, all of these things are very important. Have you had prior treatment with immunosuppressive drugs? Now, when do you switch? When do we decide to switch? It could be a number of reasons. All the things we've discussed before, the same three words, safety, efficacy, tolerability. Well, guess what? Uh, if you can't tolerate the drug, if it's not safe for you, if it's not working for you, these are all things to discuss in switching. And then how do we measure whether it's time to switch? Again, the same things we've talked about before. Are you having relapses? Are we measuring progression? Or has your MRI scan changed? So we measure those things, and then we look at safety, efficacy, and tolerability. And all these things, again, that we've talked about come into our, into our discussion. And how do we decide what drugs? Again, this is going to be up there. We pick a different drug. These drugs, they're 10 drugs. Apart from the interferons that work the same way, these drugs have different mechanisms of action. The interferons work differently from Copaxone, it's different from Gelenia, it's different from Tecrodera, it's different from Abagio. All of them have different mechanisms. So picking a different drug with a different mechanism uh, makes sense. And then the monitoring. What's the monitoring? We, you could do lab work. You may have to see a cardiologist, an ophthalmologist. All the different things, the monitoring uh, is all up there on the slides. Safety and tolerability, you would look at all these things. What are some safety aspects that you might have to consider? Uh, okay, I think I have like two and a half minutes there telling me, so I'm going to look over here at some of the research medications. You heard about, so on, so on, these, on, this, on this slide over here, if you look at your top left, you'll see alemtuzumab, used to be called Campath, now they're calling it Lemtrada. Uh, and that one is, a, hopefully, that one is knocking on the door. We're expecting the FDA to approve that within the next three months, as you saw on the slide uh, that, that is a medication that's given by infusion once a year. So you come once a day for five days, daily for five days, once a year, and we follow you a year later. It is a very potent and excellent medication, but it also has, guess what, the, the greater the benefits, maybe the greater the risk is going to require some very intensive monitoring, but you will be hearing about that in the next few months. Uh, on the top right over there, you see three drugs that are MABs, M-A-B, Daclusumab, Ocrelusumab, Ofatimumab. M-A-B stands for monoclonal antibodies. These are a mechanism, a class of drugs that are going to become very important. The first of those that we have is Tysabri, natalizumab. So these are drugs over here that are, that are coming. Uh, the, the, the bottom two on that, ocrelizumab and ofatimumab, are drugs that work on the same pathway as rituximab or rituxan that we've had for a while. These drugs all look promising. We're going to have these within the next few years. On the bottom, uh, a few other items I put there was, you see on the bottom left, I wrote there, ponisimod, or and siponimod, and you remember what Jelenia is? For those who remember what Jelenia is, it's fingolimod. 
So these are in the same family. They work the same way. Maybe they'll be more specific so we can eliminate some side effects. Uh, vitamin D, statins, and tetracyclines are being studied. The importance of vitamin D, I cannot stress enough, as Dr. Fonseca told you. Uh, very, very important in MS, important at all ages of MS. They've shown, they, they've, some studies suggest that in a pregnant woman who has deficient MS, there's a higher risk of her offspring uh, having MS. If you have MS and you, and you have children, make sure, whatever age you are, that their, MS, that their vitamin D is adequate. It's a very important, it seems a very important risk factor. And finally, on the right side, a new, whole new type of treatment, T-cell vaccination. That's coming soon. They've done a study already. The phase two study showed some benefit. And T-cell nurse is, very, is a very important and promising going forward. And um, that's, that's uh, and I will conclude just by leaving this up over here. Remember that these are all the things that you need uh, in successfully manage your MS. You need a team of friends. You need all these different things. Uh, these are the things that help you manage your MS. But uh, that's my final one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Steingo, right? That's your name? I couldn't tell behind the glasses. So does anybody have questions? You all have questions, that's good. All right, so we're gonna have two people going around the room with microphones, because we wanna hear you. Everybody else wants to hear you as well. And then also, fortunately, we have some people that handed me their questions already, and others that have written to us. We had a question um, email address, and people are writing to us off the internet with questions. So I'm glad to say those as well. All right, Maria, they have microphones, sorry. No, they have them already. Should I give it to her? All right, yeah, you give it to her. All right. All right, so anyway, while they're going around and getting, finding out where you are, we're going to ask some questions here. How often should we get blood checked when on MS meds? Who wants to answer that? Well, I guess it depends on the medication. Um, for example, in the case of the interferons, it's recommended to be done. Um, we have to check the CBC, we have to check the thyroid, we have to check the liver to make sure these things are not affected because of the medications, but it really depends on, every, on, on each individual person. At the beginning, it's a little bit more frequent. After that, if the patient has been on the medication for a while, all the labs have been stable, just to do it two, three times a year will be, will be fine unless there's a problem, obviously. In the case of the newer medications, like for example, let's take um, Tecfidera, they recommend to be done CBC to check on the lymphocytes and the white blood cells to be done before, and then ever so often, as, indic as the healthcare provider wants. In my case, I usually um, do it pretty frequently since it's a newly um, approved medication. So it really depends on the medication that it is and on a previous history the patient has had elevation of liver enzymes, for example, we might need to pay more attention to that. So it's, it really depends on the medication. Okay, next question. Craig's got one in the back there. Can you repeat, Dr. Fonseca, what optic neuritis is again, please? Sure, optic neuritis is pretty much an inflammation of the optic nerve, which are the nerves that actually help us see. And basically because of MS, just like MS can affect and cause lesions and disruption of the nerve impulses because of the destruction of the myelin and other parts of our, of our nervous system, it can also cause the same um, lesions and plaques in the optic nerve. So that can lead to inflammation, therefore it leads to blurriness of vision out of an eye or complete loss of vision out of the eye and also pain when you move the eyes. It's important to mention that MS, um, since it's different from other um, demyelinating disorders, in MS the, the loss of vision is transient. So after a couple of weeks, three weeks, obviously we need treatment. As Dr. Stein will say, it has to be IV treatment or Actergel. It will bring down the inflammation and then the, the vision will come back. So it's not a permanent loss, it's a transient loss as a result of the inflammation. Okay, before I get, hit the audience again for another question, there's one that's similar to what you were just speaking about, but this is for Dr. Steingo. They wanna know uh, what treatments there are for optic neuritis. What treatment is there for optic neuritis? Huh? How are you? Good. Uh, it's kind of, Dr. Fonseca mostly answered it. So for optic neuritis, when you first have optic neuritis, that's an acute episode. And we treat it the same way we treat any other relapse. We would use solumedrol. And typically for optic neuritis, we use one gram a day for three days to five days and follow that sometimes with a prednisone taper. And then the question that follows, the most important question is, does this person have multiple sclerosis? So if optic neuritis is the first episode, we have to determine, do you actually have multiple sclerosis already? Is this just your first episode? Or is this optic neuritis that indicates you have a high risk for developing multiple sclerosis? If you have optic neuritis, we look at your brain scan. If your brain scan is abnormal, 
and show signs of MS, that might be your first episode, and we know that you're likely to have more symptoms of MS, and we might at that stage already start treating you as if you had MS. That would be the key thing to determine. Is there a risk for MS, or is there no risk for MS, and should we start treatment for MS at that point? There are, by the way, other causes of optic neuritis other than, other than MS, and so sometimes we might need to evaluate you for other causes, such as other autoimmune diseases yeah. or some vitamin deficiencies. There are other things that can cause MS much less likely, but there are other things. All right, next question is to Maria in the back of the room. Hey, how are you, Doc? Uh, I wanted to know that new blood work that's for Tysabri that shows what percentage you have when you have the antibody. Um, how effective is that new blood work? You know, it shows I got a 0.09% on showing that I could probability of getting PML. Um, the higher you have it, you know, the more dangerous it is. I'm just curious what that blood work, you know, how effective it is and do you have to get off the medicine if you're, if, you're higher, if you're higher up, if it starts changing and going up? Yeah, so, so what you're talking about is something that we call, so JC virus, of course, and is, a, is the virus that causes PML uh, in patients in Tysabri and uh, other conditions. And in the past, what we've been able to tell you very simply is straightforward. Either you have JC virus positive or negative. And we have always said that if you're negative, your risk for PML is very low or zero. Okay. And if you're positive, that you have a certain risk for PML. And we knew about certain risk factors, such as the longer you took it, the greater the risk. If you've had prior chemotherapy, there was a risk. We understood it that way in the past. And now what's come out more recently is some evidence that we can actually see what your antibody level is. We call that the antibody index. And so we can look at your risk based on the index. And the higher the index, the greater the risk. So you could have a patient who's JC virus antibody positive, if their index number is very low, then they may have a low risk. And there is a table that you need to look at with your neurologist. And if your antibody number is high, you have a higher risk. And that can be very variable. Let me give you an example. Somebody, let's say somebody's had Tysabri for six years, and their antibody index is less than 0 0.9. Then their risk might be 0.4 in 1,000. That's 1 in 2,500. But if their antibody level is only over 1.5, their risk is 8.5 in 1,000, which is 1 in 120. So you have a 20 times greater risk if your antibody level is, 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 a, is just a little bit higher. So we need to look at the table to evaluate that. This is beginning information that we're starting to use, by the way. This information comes from studying about 2,000 patients with MS and about 70 patients with PML. So it's not everybody with this disease, but it's beginning information to help us use and to see how great your risk is. Oh, that's good question, that you don't know. The question is, what is PML? Yeah, P PML is a virus disease of the brain. Uh, it used to be seen in the past, particularly in, in people that had AIDS or people that have hematological malignancies, lymphoma and leukemia and things like that. That's where it was mostly seen. It was never really seen in MS patients. And the first time we started seeing it in MS patients is on patients on Tysabri that modified the immune system and led to the development of PML. It stands for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, if you want the full name of it. It's a disease of the white matter that can be very similar to MS, but there is no cure for PML, and it can be fatal in about 20% of cases. Okay, so Craig has a question in the back of the room. Okay, I would like to say, preface this first with my name is Joseph, and I am a dreamer. Is there any th research being going, going on to involve reconstructive therapies through such things as stem cells or these microbiotics, things like that yet? Yes, there are several um, research going on now for stem cell, for potential medications to see if they can remyelinate and, or, or cause remyelination pretty much hopefully in the future, even repair of the damage caused by demyelination from multiple sclerosis. So there's several studies done. At this point, me particularly, obviously I, we don't have anything um, approved as of this time to do stem cell or anything. That's why I particularly don't recommend it, but there are several studies that are going on to help with, hopefully further that and for us to be able to to find a potential, uh, another treatment for multiple sclerosis. Yeah, sure, certainly. Um, in the future, yes, I hope that 
as these stem cell trials that they're going on, they're able to gather probably more patients or more information. They'll be able to hopefully provide must, more information for us to feel comfortable to hopefully in the future do that if that's the case that we find that it's really helpful and beneficial. Next question is to Maria again on this side, and then we're going to take an internet question. Um, I had a question about the optic neuritis. Um, I was wondering if the, op can optic neuritis damage be reversed, specifically the blurriness and pain? Because you had described it as it being a transient loss. My doctors have all told me it's completely irreversible. What I have now, that's how blurry I'm going to be. So I'm confused sure. by that difference. The, the visual loss is what's transient. People will recover from the optic neuritis, uh, not 100% in some cases. Some people recover completely. Some people recover maybe 80, 90%. What is irreversible is the lesion. The plaque that caused the loss of myelin in the optic nerve, that will not go away. With steroids, with anything, it can, it doesn't have, we don't have the ability to remyelinate yet or have anything remyelinate. So that is irreversible. Once the optic nerve gets damaged, that lesion will stay there forever at the moment. What is transient is that the patient will have loss of vision, will have, will have pain on eye movement, or maybe blurriness of vision, but then with time, after several weeks, and obviously with treatment, then they'll be able to recover either 100% or 80%, 90%. Usually the recovery is pretty good. It's different when it's um, another sort of demyelinating disease, like for example, neuromyelitis optica, where the vision loss is usually permanent. And the only but treatment is the steroids? The IV solomedrol is the treatment, yes, intravenously, and also in the, the cases of those that are intolerant, actor gel, yes. Okay, sorry, but from the internet, how do I know when I could switch to something different, and how do I really know that medication is working? So, you know, I put some of those slides up, and I think uh, my answer to that would be go back when you have time and look over the slides. So, the way you measure if the drug is working is essentially three things. Are you having relapses? And the way I would say to someone is, what you report to me is important. Are you having relapses? That's the first thing. So, and then the second thing is my measurement of you, my examination. Do I see progression? And the third thing we look at is the MRI scan. So those would be the three measures. Is the drug, say, is, is the drug working, relapses, progression, and disability? And then the other aspect we would look at is other things. Is it safe? Are you having safety issues? For example, you might have a liver abnormality or some other abnormality. Is it safe? Is it tolerable? So it's efficacy, which is the relapses, the disability, and the MRI, and then safety and tolerability. All of those are the things we look at to decide when it's time to switch. Okay, Craig, your person. Thanks. Uh, I tolerate solumedrol fairly well, and as a result, I've had it a few times, and I'm really concerned about the side effects as I get older and I think about bone loss and so on. Do I have a leg to stand on, given that I tolerate it well, to ask for Akthar instead? So um, Akthar, the reason why Akthar is not the first choice, even though it's very effective and trials have suggested it's equally effective as solumedrol, is that it's very expensive. Akthar almost became extinct. The company almost shut down. The company had to go to the FDA uh, because it's used for other conditions such as, uh, as infantile spasms and it became an orphan drug and it's very expensive. So we have to, when we ask for the medication, we have to usually, I always dictate a note and say why I'm using it that someone is intolerant of solumedrol, or it's not working, so some of those things. Now, going forward, there is some evidence that maybe Akthar might have some more protective effect in bones. There is a very scary condition that can, affect, that can occur with steroids and solumedrol called avascular necrosis. It can usually affect the hips. They will degenerate, may even have to be replaced, and it can affect other joints. There is some evidence going forward that maybe Akthar is protective against that particular thing. So if someone does have osteoporosis, that could be another reason we could write, and we would have to send them the literature to support that. Other than that, though, we, there would not be a good reason for us to get it. An insurance company, most insurance companies will ask for a note. They won't all. If they don't, it might be possible to try it. Okay, in the center of the room. Hi, everyone. Um, for you, Dr. Steinberg, are there any new medicines that you think that you might that might come that might come new like Tysavery and all that stuff I'm on Tysavery and I'm doing better every day and it's all good any new medicines that 
is named by the by the, I forgot the word. Um, yeah, there there are new medications. One of the last slides I showed showed you all the drugs and research that are coming. Uh, so there are a lot of new medicines that are coming for MS. We're going to have Campeth or Lemtrada or Alemtuzumab coming in the next few months. Very potent medication. Requires very intensive monitoring. Maybe you're doing blood tests every month for years. In the clinical trial patients, we're doing their blood almost monthly for years. And ans answered an earlier question about monitoring. Uh, for progressive forms of MS, there is really only one FDA-approved drug for a secondary progressive, uh, which is a chemotherapy drug, Novantrone. There are no other approved drugs for, for progressive forms of MS, but there are m drugs in clinical trials for progressive types of MS. Okay, to Maria on the side of the room, please. Yes, this is about a symptom. Um, I've had the MS hug a few times, and a couple of weeks ago I had something similar to it, but it was on my foot. Believe it or not, my foot started hurting a little bit at the arch, and then it went across, and then I could feel the sciatic nerve irritated, and it started spasming to where when I was trying to walk, it literally brought my foot up off the floor, and I laid down, and the pain was just unbelievable. And I took a Vicodin and a Baclofen for the spasms, and it lasted about two hours. And it was very scary because I don't know what brought it on. I mean, is this something that could happen like when you're at work or something? Or is this common? But it, was, it hurt just like the MS hug hurt. It was just on my leg, it, you know, my foot and my leg. Do you have any suggestions that might could help me to learn to live with this or prevent it? Well, I would advise you, first of all, to mention it to your healthcare provider, since he's the one that knows, obviously, more about you and your particular MS. I did. But I called him. I called him, and he just good. said it was, he had a word for it, sporadic muscle spasms or something yeah, was what he had said. But it's just scary that your body can start spasm like that and just lay you flat in bed. Sure. Spasms are very common. For that, we do have, as you well said, medications that work for um, spasticity in particular, muscle relaxants. Something also may be of consideration if there's not contraindication to maybe hopefully think about physical therapy where they can do certain exercises to help stretch or teach the person to do certain exercises for, for stretching and to sort of try to counteract a little bit the weakness or the spasticity. So that's another option, but certainly usually that can happen. Um, with MS very frequently. Also, we have to make sure that we don't assume everything is MS related because yes, for the most part it can be, but there can be other things as well. So to make sure that they check uh, the back and other things to make sure that they don't, they're not playing a role in the problem and we're just here assuming it's MS and only treating that and not taking care of other potential things that could be going on. Thank you. Before we continue, I just want to let everybody know that, yeah, we have a limited amount of time today in, in doing this Q&A, all right? There are over 200 people in this room, and there's no way we could get to everybody. Plus, we have over, I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping a few hundred on the internet, all right? And they're, in, they're turning in questions. Whoever's questions we don't get to today, I'm going to give to these doctors and ask them to fill it out, and we'll get it put out on a general mailing that will be put on the blog or somewhere where everybody could read whatever questions you give us and that are in my possession, okay? That's all I could say. We're only doing this for another 10 minutes. We extended it five minutes. They're gonna bring in lunch, sorry. Late five minutes, because we got too many questions. All right, next one from the internet. In the meantime, Craig, can you get down to that end of the room or somebody get to that end? Because there's a few questions over there. Off the um, cards given to me, I have gastro problems, bloating and digestive issues. How do, how, I, I'm sorry, I can't read this. Does, whoever wrote this, do you know what you wrote? <laughs> okay, next question. Besides vitamin D level and, and, uh, and what, else is, what else should be checked? So, just for the prior person that we don't want to ignore completely, gastro issues can occur. So the first thing you need to do, like we said earlier, is make sure there's no other condition. The one mistake that many, many physicians seem to want, maybe because they're lazy, is to say to someone, your problems are from MS. So remember, because you've got MS, it doesn't immunize you against any other disease. If you've got gastro issues or colon issues or bowel issues, you want to make sure that there's nothing else in your system that's causing these problems, firstly, and that it's not your medications before we start to blame it on the MS. That's the gastro thing. Uh, then in terms of checking, so vitamin D, we said, was by far the most important or very important vitamin specifically for MS. The other vitamin that's important to check is B12. 
B12 is a very important vitamin in general uh, for, for hematology and for the nervous system. So if you have a vitamin B12 deficiency, it can affect your nervous system in general. So if you have a nervous system disease, it's very important to make sure you have adequate B12. So those are the two vitamins that I would say are, are routinely should be uh, monitored. Okay, next, Craig, your side of the room. Uh, I understand that MS can cause some cognitive impairment, but what are the effects on intellectual ability? Like how does it affect, how does it affect your IQ or? It does not affect IQ reason? at all. Um, basically, whatever IQ that person has will continue having it, so it's not going to affect IQ at all. It mainly affects, in some patients, concentration, um, their recent memory, or the short, what we call the short-term memory, things that happened recently, um, ability to multitask, maybe they need to focus on one thing at a time and then proceed to the next task, but it does not affect the IQ and the intellect. That remains untouched. Thank you. Maria's side of the room. Hi, um, I'm fairly new to having MS. It's been a little bit over a year, and I'm pretty sure that everybody has had this same thing happen to them. When we're first diagnosed with MS, uh, most of us go tingling on our left side, and I haven't met anyone who has MS who tingles on their right side where they go paralyzed. Can you guys explain to me why that happens to the left side, why it's left dominant, not right? No, I, I'm not quite getting it quite. Are you saying that, that you heard that symptoms are more common on the left side? Yeah, so when you're first diagnosed, no. you get your initial diagnosis, like your, your left side is tingling and you may be paralyzed. I've never met anyone who had right side problems. No. MS is not selective. MS will affect any part of your brain, optic nerve, or spinal cord. It doesn't care about left or right, top or bottom. MS can affect anywhere. There's no predilection for a particular side. Can I, and if somebody told you they heard that, that's incorrect. It can affect anywhere. Those white spots you saw can be anywhere. All right, that sums it up. Thanks. <laughs> on the left side of the room again. Uh, Dr. Francesca, you mentioned that after methylprednisone, that your symptoms would go back to baseline. Uh, ba it, after an episode, uh, someone would not go back to normal if they took meth methylprednisone. Doesn't it impact them in some case? And you also mentioned that the lesions um, will heal faster with methylprednisone. So will they will heal even if you don't take methylprednisone? Well, Methylprednisolone, what it does is um, speed up the recovery, let's say. It speeds up the recovery. The healing or basically the formation, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of the scar or the plaque will happen. Either or. <clears throat> Whether we give IV solumedrol or not, it will heal. Or the scar will form, meaning um, the plaque, the MS plaque. Just what we do with methylprednisolone or solumedrol is to try to, for it to give less symptoms faster to speed it up so that that patient can go back to their activities normally, hopefully. And with relapsing remitting, we tend to see that for the most part, when a patient has a relapse, they're able to go back to their baseline. And we just try to speed it up with the solumedrol if there's no obvious contraindication for it. Otherwise, then we will have to let it heal on its own and the symptoms to go away in a couple of weeks. Okay, so, excuse me, in the front of the room we have this gentleman. He's been waiting patiently. Um, I've been having issues with my vision, um, pain, uh, floaters. I went to my uh, eye doctor and she didn't see anything. I have yet to be diagnosed with optic neuritis. Is this something that may be progressive, that they may not catch it at first and then they'll see it when I get exams and how often should I get an eye exam? <clears throat> well, um, Whenever there's an optic neuritis or, or, or a lesion on the optic nerve, as I said before, it's never going to heal. So symptoms can come and go. For example, it's very common for somebody to have had an optic neuritis. It re he or she recovered, went back to seeing okay, but then maybe they're going out and they're uh, exercising in uh, 90 degrees. So that obviously could bring back old symptoms and there they could be maybe a temporary blurring of the vision or the patient might see a little bit different or funny, funky because of the fact that the symptoms can come back. Heat, stress, fatigue, infection, etc. can predispose that patient to having symptoms back. The most important thing is to at least get checked once a year or more if necessary by a neuro-ophthalmologist and to make sure that yes, optic neuritis can cause you to have symptoms uh, common goal, but we have to make sure that there's nothing else affecting the, the eye or the optic nerve that's just not MS. 
that's very important to make sure that we exclude that. Thank you. To Maria in the front of the room. Um, I just wanted to ask, when you have an MRI, I've had occasions where I'm having a relapse right there, and then I go and get an MRI, and I get the gadolinium, and nothing shows up. Is that, I mean, I, it's happened to me at least twice. Is that, how accurate is the actual MRI reading? Yeah, so I, I, did, I did mention that, that the MRI doesn't always correlate. You could, you could be having an episode, and the MRI doesn't show the active lesion. Well, the opposite could happen. You could say, I feel great. I'm, I'm coming for my annual visit. I feel great. We do a scan and there's five active spots. So those things can happen in some people. Definitely can happen. We don't completely understand that. Like I said, what the MRI shows us predominantly is white matter disease. But MS is a disease that affects the gray matter as well. And on the scans that we have currently, the routine MRI scan you're going to do now, the gray matter does not show up well at all. And so as with new technologies in the next few years, we're going to have MRI scans that show us the gray matter better, and we'll probably be able to pick up more things. So that's probably what's happening when you don't have anything showing up, is it's either in the gray matter or it's a small lesion or somewhere else. For example, let's say you have a relapse, and they, and depends on what the relapse is, they might do an MRI of your brain. Maybe the problem's in the spinal cord. So sometimes the lesion could be missed because you're not looking in the right place. So that could be something that's happening too. All right. We only have time for two more questions, okay? We have our two persons. One is right there, the other one's right at the front of the room. Okay. Then again, it's just gonna have to be done off the internet afterwards. Yeah, I'm reading more and more children of parents that have MS or contacting MS. And my question is, with the Epstein-Barr virus being a, a variable and low vitamin D level, is there anything being studied, the Epstein-Barr virus vaccine, and what are the recommended levels of vitamin D that we should have in our children? Because both of my children I had tested were positive Epstein-Barr virus and low vitamin D levels. So I'm just, you know, getting a little concerned, you know, with that. You do, you do the last one. You can do the last one. Okay, I'll do this, and Dr. Fonseca will do the last one. Okay, so the answer there is we, as you saw before, MS is a disease in which we believe people have a genetic predisposition. So if, if, you, if you look at their genetics, they're, in some ways they're set up to develop this, and then something else happens that brings out the MS. And so we understand there are different things. For example, there are environmental factors, like people that are born up north maybe have a higher rate of MS. And the factors we know about are just the ones you quoted, Epstein-Barr virus, and there may be other viruses as well. But if you look at the blood of people with MS and look at their antibodies, there's much more of them that have had Epstein-Barr virus than others. So that's one risk factor. So you might have, genetically you're predisposed, then you get Epstein-Barr virus, and now you're at higher risk, and then you have low vitamin D, you're even at higher risk. And that goes to the child in utero, when the mother is pregnant, that her vitamin D level should be good, and that your children's vitamin D level should be good. And if you look at the lab range, the lab quotes a range of 30 to 100 for vitamin D, and we think that people with MS should be high in that range, maybe 60 or 70 or 80. So if your level's 35 and 40, and your PCP says, great, you're 40, you're not high enough. We like to push it higher, up to about, uh, you know, much higher range. We want about 70. 70. 70, 70 units, yeah, that's the, the measurement for the level. What about, 70 teen, units. What about teenagers? <coughs> yes, your teenagers, your kids from all ages, when you have okay. kids, whatever age they are, okay. when they go to the pediatrician, when they're four or five years old, even here in Florida, when you're saying there's sunshine, there may not be enough. Some people might not absorb it enough, might not manufacture enough. At all ages, in, in any children, if, if you have MS, your children have, may have some genetic tendency and they need to be protected and you need to make sure that their vitamin D level is adequate. And smoking is the other risk factor Dr. Fonseca showed you. A recent study showed that people that, that uh, take interferon and smoke have higher instance of antibodies, which means their interferons won't work. So in all ways, smoking is bad as well. Okay, our last question again. For anybody else that has questions that are not getting answered, bring your questions up to me during our break. Again, we'll get them answered. We'll get them out to you afterwards. Maria, your person. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak about what's the difference between gray and white matter? That's a good one. The white, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the, in the MRI that Dr. Stango showed before, the white matter is the inner part. Right? Our brain basically con consists of gray matter, white matter. Gray matter is located in the outside of the brain, so the outer 
um, part of the brain, and then in the inside is the white matter. Um, as Dr. Stang was saying before, we thought MS was just of the white matter, just the white matter was the one that got affected, but that, now we know that it's the white matter and the gray matter as well. And they play different roles in the white matter. There's a lot of the um, tracks and the, the ways this is going to be a little bit hard for me to explain, but just all the wiring, let's say, all the connections that go all the way from our brain to the rest of our limbs were all the connections that the brain, so that the brain can send the impulses, let's say, and the commands to different parts of the body. So that's why there can be symptoms. You can have a lesion in the brain and there can be a symptom that reflects in your um, left leg or the right arm or whatever. So it really depends on the area, but the white matter is basically in charge of controlling all these let's say, carrying all these wires to the rest of the body. Okay, I want to thank our doctors for coming out here and speaking today. I have, I have certificate of appreciation to give to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Again, just for you all to know, food is now being delivered. It's coming into the room. Okay, it's hard to do that while the doctors are speaking as well. We're going to go to some downtime right now. It's going to be a half hour. They're going to get the food all served. After which, at 12.20, we're going to start. Instead of 12.15, the complimentary and alternative panel will begin at that time. Okay? We're going to start with the first one with nutrition, of course, while you're eating, right? Okay, so we'll try, start with nutrition, and then we're going to go to acupuncture, and then some uh, wellness for, you know, what to do while you're all stressed out during the day. I think I need to listen to that as well. So, um, again, if you need the restrooms, now's the time to go, although only a certain amount are going to fit in there at a time. But, um, you know, again, you have a half hour break right now. In a little while, I'm going to get the raffle tickets and I'm going to draw a couple of numbers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for responding. Again, the same rules apply as earlier. We have to keep the chatter to a minimum. We want to hear what our speakers have to say. Our first presenter today is, is Melissa Kaplan. Melissa Kaplan is a registered dietitian who teaches people how to use the power of food as medicine. And here we have Melissa Kaplan. Come on up. So, who's your presenter? There's the screen. Got it. I'm out of your way for 15 minutes. Okay. You just have to click them over there. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to presenting to you guys and hopefully being able to answer you qu your questions about nutrition and MS. So uh, again, like Stuart had uh, introduced, my name is Melissa Kaplan. I'm a registered dietitian, and I help to create customized eating plans for those who want to reach optimum wellness. So before I start off, just by a show of hands, I'd like to know how many of you guys choose and eat foods, mostly um, due to the health benefits of those foods. Wow, I want to give that about 90% of the audience here. That's great. A lot of conscious people here. And of those that raised their hands, how many have noticed any kind of health benefits from starting making those changes to choose healthier foods? Okay, most. I'm going to say maybe 80% of that and 90%. Great. Well, this afternoon I'm going to go through about 10, 15 minutes about nutritional interventions for MS. I'm going to discuss uh, current evidence on MS and nutrition discuss a recommended eating plan, and then um, a short little bit on supplementation. So just to let you know, first off, there is not a whole lot of evidence for specific dietary guidelines for MS at this time. Uh, early, early studies have shown that a diet that's low in saturated fat, high in fiber, adequate vitamin D, and um, mostly plant-based has shown to help the, um, to help positively affect the, the MS. 
The next point is I think that you had heard earlier from the neurologist about vitamin D. There is ample evidence on vitamin D and adequate stores to help prevent the progression of the disease state. And what is currently accepted for dietary guidelines is to follow a low saturated fat and higher fiber diet. Low saturated fat, higher in fiber. So that's kind of what I want to review with you today. We call this a plant-based meal plan. Plant-based meal plan with additional supplementation if necessary is pretty much what's recommended for MS. Why is a plant-based meal plan recommended? You can see here, Mostly because plants, fruits, veggies, whole grain, nuts, seeds, lentils, and some teas have what you call phytonutrients. And phytonutrients are nutrients, chemicals actually, in those foods that I just listed that have been shown to have a bioactive plant-derived compound that's been associated with positive health benefits. So the foods listed here, fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, whole grains, teas, bees, legumes, nuts, those things are the most powerful foods that you can choose. And I would say around 80 to 90 percent of your intake should come from those foods, if possible. You can see on this table here um, a list of different colors representing different kinds of phytonutrients. So just to start off, you've probably heard of some of these. Vitamin C, well-known antioxidant, resveratrol. Where do you find that? I think I heard it. Red wine, resveratrol is a known antioxidant, uh, phytonutrient, and um, lycopene in tomatoes. So you can see here, for example, fruits and veggies that are orange or yellow colored have vitamin C, grapes, tangerine, peaches, papayas, nectarines, oranges, and orange juice, very rich in that phytonutrient, vitamin C. Orange colored vegetables like mangoes, apricots, acorn squash, pumpkin, very high in beta carotene. Beta carotene is the precursor of vitamin A, shown to have many other health uh, benefits. Uh, as you can see here, the red and purple vegetables, like red grapes, red cabbage, red peppers, prunes, red pears, those uh, fruits and veggies have anthocyanids and resveratrol. So it's not only found in red wine, you can include other things in there to get that uh, phytonutrient. Lycopene, I mentioned, is in foods that are red, like tomatoes and tomato sauce, tomato products, also watermelon and uh, pink grapefruit. Sometimes you have to cook the foods to release those phytonutrients. Lycopene in tomatoes is one of those foods. So to activate that phytonutrient, lycopene, the tomato has to be heated. Green, yellow vegetables, such as spinach, avocado, honeydew melon, um, green peas, green beans, kiwi, cucumber, those foods have lutein in it, again another phytonutrient, known health benefits. Green veggies, you can see here we know broccoli, Brussels sprouts, the carciferous vegetables as you're being served here at lunch today, I can see that as one of your side dishes, um, have a huge amount of health benefits and known to be helpful in other um, in other chronic illness like Crohn's and colitis, also autoimmune diseases. White green veggies, garlic, chives, onions, celery, leeks, asparagus, artichokes, these things again just give you a wide variety of nutrients that can help you prevent further decline of MS. Things to avoid. So if you're thinking, okay, I'm eating around 80% of my intake from the foods I just recommended, other things that you can add in are lean, lean meats, lean proteins. But I would say to avoid red meat, pork, lamb, and stick to the wild fish, cold water fish. It gives you omega-3 fatty acids, we all know, help with the heart, help with the immune system. So red meat, try to avoid that. Limit that maybe to once a month if you can. If you're starting out eating red meat pretty regularly, maybe three or four times a week, take small steps to reduce it, maybe down to one or two times a week. Small steps make bigger changes. High fat dairy is something you also want to avoid. So whether it's high fat, yo regular fat yogurt, regular fat cottage cheese, uh, ice cream, those things you want to limit very, very, a couple times a month at most, have that less than in moderation. Fried foods, you know, not to be included on a regular, on your regular meal plan, and any kind of processed foods. So when I talk about processed foods, you think about 
the inner aisles of the supermarket. So if you shop around the periphery of the supermarket, you're getting fresh, unprocessed foods, things that are more in their natural state. So you can think of processed foods, they have spent more time in a plant than actually being a plant. One of my all-time heroes uh, created that quote, Michael Pollan, who actually he's, uh, has done some research in MS as well, and of course has has been an advocate for the, the use and the advantage of phytonutrients in a plant-based diet. I think that you guys have heard a little bit about vitamin D already, right? You've known a little bit about it? So um, there have been a couple studies on vitamin D. The top study listed here looked at the uh, prevention of developing MS, and the other one looked at the, uh, the, the progression of the, of the MS. So basically, a study conducted by researchers at Oxford University and the New Jersey Medical School have suggested that maintaining adequate levels of vitamin D may have a protective effect and lower the risk of developing multiple sclerosis, right? So this is uh, the study that has been shown to actually help prevent the onset of the disease. And the second study conducted states that people who already have MS, vitamin D may lessen the frequency and severity of the symptoms. So adequate vitamin D is very important and the institutes of medicine basically recommend 600 international units per day. We don't eat a lot of vitamin D in food. Most of it's generated from the UV rays of the sun. So it's recommended if you're not eating maybe canned sardines that have the bones that have the, the, a little bit of vitamin D. Also fortified low fat dairy has vitamin D. You can uh, spend about 30 minutes in the sun every day to be able to have your body generate adequate vitamin D uh, in your serum. It's recommended to get it you know, periodically to make sure you have adequate amounts. You may need more, typically a standard supplement is around 2,000 IU a day, but sometimes if your levels are really low, it's been known for physicians to recommend 50,000 units uh, per month until your serum, until your blood serum normalizes. So basically highlights right now, plant-based diet. If you think about your plate as a whole, one whole, 100% of your intake, half of that plate should be covered in fresh vegetables, some fruits, lean proteins, healthy fats, unsaturated fats, and whole grains, barley, rice, quinoa, those things have, again, phytonutrients as well. Try to plan your meals so you're eating something every three hours. This will help to prevent hunger so you make better food choices. So if you think about it, you've gone a long time without eating, maybe four or five hours, you start getting hungry and you get panicky, you'll grab whatever is kind of closest and easiest for you, but that might not be the best choice. So if you can, plan your meals to have something to eat every three hours or so to keep your stomach relatively full and satisfied. The last point is choose a great multivitamin, just kind of for insurance, and one that also has vitamin D. If you have any more information, this is my contact email address, and I know there's going to be a little bit of time for question and answer once the panel's been completed. No time to eat, sorry. All right, so next up we have Jane Kaufman. Jane is a former migraine headache sufferer. Jane became interested in oriental Chinese medicine after personally experience, experiencing its benefits. Migraine free for many years. Jane enrolled in and graduated from the Southeast Institute of Oriental Medicine. Want me to keep going? She completed a four-year course of comprehensive graduate training and became a licensed, board-fied, certified acupuncture physician. She also has additional certification from the National Acupuncture Detox Association and the International Cupping Therapy Association, which she earned after extensive training in the use of these specialized therapies to enhance patient health and well-being. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. How's everybody feeling? Good after lunch. I just want to mention 
I just want to mention that contrary to what you see here today, not all practitioners of alternative medicine have curly hair. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to tell you a little bit about Chinese medicine and how it may be an assist to you. Before I get started, though, I want to talk a little bit about my background. As Stuart mentioned, I was a former migraine sufferer, and I had really tried everything. I grew up with my mom suffering from migraines, and I grew up in an environment where my mother's migraines really affected our family life. So as a child, I was always very concerned that I would wind up with migraines and decided that if I did, I would find a way to manage it successfully. And after trying many modalities, not just Western medicine and, and medication, but other modalities, acupuncture was really what made a difference for me. So this is something that I'm very passionate about. It made a profound difference in my life. All right, so a little bit about Chinese medicine. It's a different way to view health, okay? When we talk to a patient, we're interested in supporting the entire body, the whole person, because we believe that everything is very interconnected. If a patient comes to the office with headaches, we don't just talk to them about their head pain. We talk to them about everything going on in the body because it's very important. We also believe that the body has an innate capacity to heal. What does that mean? It means that the body really wants to move in the direction of health and wellness. Sometimes it needs a little nudge. So with acupuncture and Chinese medicine, we're able to push the body in that direction of healing. And we do believe that in many situations, this can be the best cure. So we've all heard the expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, in Chinese medicine, we don't look at it that way. We say if it's not broken, let's prevent it from breaking. In large part, what we do is we want to restore a patient's health, but we want to keep them healthy before they get sick, before they have issues. And that's a big difference between what we do and what you'll see the Western medical practitioners do in many situations. So a little bit about the theories of Chinese medicine because we operate off of different principles in the Western world. There's two basic theories that we talk about a lot in Chinese medicine, two terms that you might have heard of. The first one is qi. Qi refers to the energy that moves through the body. Okay, if your qi is moving well, you'll be healthy. But if you have blocked energy or blocked qi, it will result in illness or disease. Think about a garden hose with a kink in it for a minute. If you have a garden hose that has a kink in it and you turn the water on, what happens? The water drips out. Not great, but you'll get a little bit of water. But once you open up that kink, you'll see the water flow. And that's what we're working towards in the body is opening up any blockages so that you can feel your absolute best. Another theory that we work off of is yin and yang. A lot of people have heard of those terms, yin and yang. They're opposing opposites. And we work with the acupuncture to help balance the forces, the natural forces in the body. We don't want too much of any one energy or not enough of another. It's all about balance. Now, if you were to ask a practitioner of Western medicine, someone who's not an acupuncture physician, how does acupuncture work? They'll probably give you one of two answers. They'll say that it stimulates the central nervous system, and they'll also tell you that acupuncture releases chemicals, endorphins, and that these chemicals work to dull pain, boost the immune system, and regulate the body system. So that's just a little bit about how Chinese medicine acupuncture works. So I've been talking a lot about balance, how we try to balance the body, because that's really what this practice of medicine is about. It's about keeping the body in balance. But what happens when you're out of balance? When you're out of balance, you will have a loss of health and well-being, okay? If you have a chi or an energy imbalance that's not dealt with, it can result in pain, illness, or disease. And basically, it will be an impairment of the body's ability to adapt. And it's very important because like I said, it's all about balance. So what do we do in Chinese medicine to help balance the body? There are several treatment modalities that we use. Of course, the first is acupuncture, the most popular. And I just want to talk a little bit about the needles. Everybody is a little bit fearful of the needles. And I have to say that when I went for acupuncture treatment years ago, that was my biggest hesitation. I envisioned lying on a table with a bunch of hypodermic needles stuck in my body, and I really wasn't ready to sign up for that. But in fact, the needles that we use for acupuncture are very different from the needles that a doctor uses. The needles that we use are very fine and thin, about the thickness of a hair. 
They're solid. They don't have a hollow channel in it because we're not injecting blood. I mean, I'm sorry, we're not injecting medication. We're not drawing blood. So it is a solid, very fine, thin needle. Patients report different sensations when we place the needles. Some patients will tell me that they feel nothing. Some say they feel a warmth, a heaviness, a tingling, or a surge of energy. But whatever the sensation is that's felt upon placement of a needle, it generally dissipates in two to three seconds. The other thing that's very popular about acupuncture is regardless of what we're treating, it's a very relaxing treatment. And we all know the benefits of stress relief. We also use herbs. We may use some other modalities, specifically moxibustion, which is a Chinese herb that we burn just over the surface of the skin. We always are promoting movement in a patient, whether it's qigong, tai chi, yoga, all very important, and cupping as well. Acupuncture is very safe. Acupuncture has been treating billions of people for thousands of years. There's virtually no side effects. It's safe, it's effective, and it's drug-free. In fact, the National Institute of Health and the World Health Organization recognizes acupuncture as an effective means in treating many medical conditions. This is important to note. Chinese medicine integrates naturally with Western medicine. Many times patients will say to me, well, I, I'm going to a doctor, I take medication, do you think I can really you know, have an acupuncture treatment? We complement what Western doctors do. We do not obstruct it, we do not get in the way. We work together with Western doctors, okay? So that is not an issue. And sometimes, in fact, we're able to fix things that Western medicine cannot. So let's talk a little bit about standard drug therapy, something that most of you are very familiar with. Standard drug therapy definitely has a place in managing illness. However, we all know that these drugs are accompanied by side effects, and unfortunately, some of them are serious. Chinese medicine, on the other hand, is effective, it's milder, and there's rarely any side effects. So it's a completely different approach. So what can we actually do for the MS patient with Chinese medicine? There's a number of uh, conditions that come along with MS. Some of them are very treatable with acupuncture. Of course, the cognitive and emotional issues, spasticity, balance and coordination, numbness and tingling, fatigue, bladder and bowel issues, as well as tremors. So we are able to address all these issues with Chinese medicine. What's our objective of care? In a general sense, our objective of care looks like this, and this is in any patient. We're looking, of course, to relieve pain and discomfort. We also want to eliminate any signs and symptoms of the condition. We're always supporting the immune system in an acupuncture treatment. You could be there for stress relief or a bad knee. The treatment will always support the immune system. We're always looking to balance and maintain the organs, as I spoke about, and optimally, we're looking to restore and maintain your health. What's the goal of treatment for an MS patient? Because it's a little bit different. We're always looking to improve recovery from relapse. Unfortunately, with this condition, we know that relapses can occur. We're looking to improve the recovery time. We're also looking to reduce the number of relapses. We're focusing on slowing the progression of disease and relieving the complications due to loss of function. So as far as Chinese medicine goes, let's consider this. Western medicine definitely has a place when you're dealing with medical conditions. But sometimes it might be prudent, rather than investing 100% of your well-being in one method, to explore other options. And that's really what the focus of this presentation was about today. I hope that I was able to enlighten you as to some other option uh, that might be helpful to you. Thank you. Okay, so we come down to our last complimentary panelist, and that will be Michelle Alva. Michelle is an energy healer and holistic physical therapist at the Canyon Ranch in Miami Beach. She empowers and educates individuals on how to de-stress, heal, and increase their healability, utilizing an integrative approach that blend, blends principles of yoga, belly dance, that's not me, <laughs> massage, physical therapy, and energy medicine. 
Michelle, it's your turn. How are we feeling? Woohoo! So because we sit six, how many people here sit more than six to eight hours a day? Raise your hand. So this is, this is where the belly dance, as we all know, belly dance, there's shimmies, there's hip circles, there's all these movements of the pelvis. And as a physical therapist, I very proudly say, I know what I'm doing when I'm teaching people how to dance because you're learning how to do a therapeutic movement modality, which is really fun. And vibration stimulates the healing hormone. So it's actually really wonderful, even if you're laying down, to shake your body. And I'm not gonna ask you to do that right now for obvious reasons, but yes, shimmies, shaking, doing repetitive movements that are fast, help to stimulate the lymphatic flow, the hormonal flow. They help to stimulate the healing hormone oxytocin, which also stimulates the endorphins. This is the same effect when you're getting acupuncture, the needles, the acupuncturist is vibrating the needle and that stimulates the healing hormone. And we sure wanna feel pleasure and love and connection and healing, right? Yeah. Let me hear a yeah. yeah. So for people that have the diagnosis of MS, it is really important to tap in on this hormone. You have it circulating in your body anyway. So you actually are your own hospital, pharmacy, retreat center. You are your own healer. And sometimes we are not our best cheerleaders. We're not our best friends. Sometimes we get too caught up in the labels. When I walk to the room with my clients at Canyon Ranch, they hand me a medical chart. And some medical charts look like Bibles. They are that thick. Does anybody's medical chart look like that? So what happens is we start to identify very tightly to our chart. MS, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, whatever other names we've been given. And I think what a lo big part of my job as a healer is to help us to keep remembering who we are. You are so much more than any medical term. And sometimes we get very upset because we have certain titles and labels. And we start to really weigh heavily who we are on those words. And the truth is now, right now is the only moment that we have in our life right now this moment so am i going to bring myself into this moment in a loving attitude or am i going to get upset about what could happen to me in a day two days a month a year am i going to live fully right now because i know for sure that right now is what i have so this is what I've personally learned a lot from the clients that I've worked with that have a diagnosis of MS. So I like to say I have a diagnosis of whatever it is. Because when you say I am, or I have MS, or I have, you start to, you kind of put that in your head. You're putting it even more in yourself. So your intention, whatever it is that you're putting out there of what you think you are, you become that. So if I want to lose weight, I'm not gonna say I'm fat, I wanna lose weight. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna create the awareness of what that would feel like to be thin. So if there's something holding you back, and this applies to anything, let's just say that I'm not patient and that I wanna be more patient with myself. I'm gonna say I'm soft on myself. I, instead of me saying, oh, I'm so hard on myself to everybody. So I, I'm here to just make you think a little today, because Lord knows I could talk about science, and if anybody wants to come, visit me at Canyon Ranch. I offer free lectures on healing and energizing from the inside out every week on Thursdays at 11. Just let me know, send me an email, say, Michelle, I want to come. I'll meet you at the lobby, we'll walk together. And um, I also made a CD of guided meditations called Free Yourself. I like to focus on solutions, but I don't want to live my life for the solution. We gotta have fun in the now. So these are resources that I've created that I am, that help you to increase the oxytocin in your body, the love hormone. It helps you to release emotional stress. 
A lot of us today have emotional stress. How many of us are physically stressed? How many of you have physically, okay, so we have physical stress, right? Our bodies are not, we're not able to control them. How many of us feel out of control? That causes stress. Or we're not sure of ourselves. We doubt ourselves. And the more nervous we get, the more anxious we get about it, we are not helping that body. So we can actually start to reflect on how do I feel about my body? What is my perception? What is my attachment to the beliefs about my body? Do I believe my body's healing right now? You know your nerves are actually healing all the time. Did you know that? When you get a cut, you don't have to tell your arm to heal that. Your body's gonna heal it. So just like Jane said, the body wants to move towards balance. We actually are constantly healing ourselves, constantly. We don't have to think about it. There's this energy, this wisdom inside of us. Our hormones, they communicate, and they want us to digest the food that's in our belly. They want us to have a bowel movement. Our body cells want us to regenerate. That's just our nature. But if I hate my disease, if I'm upset that I was of what's going on in my body and I'm not accepting it, I'm not helping my digestion, I'm not helping my healing ability. So right now I want everyone to close their eyes and we're gonna take the deepest, fullest breath of oxygen because we all need oxygen to heal. We need oxygen to breathe and live. So don't just take a little bit of it and don't, don't dwell on how strong your diaphragm is, okay? Because some of us, it might not be as strong. We're just gonna hog in, take it all in, all that juicy, delicious oxygen from the trees right now. A deep breath in. Fill yourself up with life force, energy, oxygen. Do that a few more times. Breathe in. Take it all in. Take a deeper breath in, a breath of gratitude that this is how much you can breathe. You can even try a little more. Give that intention. I breathe in life to the fullest right now. And then exhale, let go of stress. <sighs> let go of any judgments you've made about your body. <sighs> let go if you've been hard on yourself. Just let that go right now. You don't have to hold on to that. Some of us might feel a little guilty as I talk about this. Maybe we haven't been too nice to ourselves. So forgiveness actually causes you to increase your oxytocin. Forgiving yourself. Not judging. Accepting. Being compassionate for yourself. These things relax us. How many of you feel frustrated on a day-to-day -day basis with your body? Let's just be honest, because being truthful is healing. I'm hard on myself too, but that makes me a better person, right? There's some good stuff about that, right? But when it starts to weigh you down and you feel exhausted because you're perpetuating, you're ruminating about negative thoughts about yourself, it drains us, right? So that's a beautiful opportunity to come back to your breath. And we have a muscle here called the diaphragm. It's the muscle of inspiration. And this muscle actually helps us to process emotions and it also stimulates oxytocin. Just breathing with your diaphragm stimulates the love hormone, the healing hormone. So you can get in a comfortable position at home where you can feel this muscle with your hands. You can do this right now and just touch where your ribs and your abdomen meet. And we're gonna take the deepest breath, but we're gonna do it like this. We're gonna do three sniffs, because it's actually easier to stimulate the muscle to contract for those people that are a little weaker in the diaphragm. We're gonna sniff, sniff, sniff. So if I know that sniffing makes me produce a contraction of the muscle much easier with less effort, I'm gonna do that, right? So we're gonna go like this. It's three sniffs. <laughs> Inhale, inhale, inhale. And the third one, you want to drag it. <laughs> and we're going to create vibration. <laughs> because remember, I told you, vibration also stimulates the love hormone, healing hormone. So let's do this a few times. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to do it. Let's feel it together. And as we do this, let's breathe in love and acceptance 
and just this moment, because that's all we have, okay? So we're going to do it a few times. <sighs> Close your eyes and feel it. <sighs> we're increasing physiologically the love hormone. This is your pump. This is how you pump your love hormone in your own self. <sighs> and you don't do it judging yourself. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it good enough? Oh man, my diaphragm's not really doing it. So the minute you get your mind into it, you're losing the effect of love. Whenever we judge, criticize, analyze, and not accept the moment as it is, we're blocking the flow of chi, we're blocking the flow of love, of healing. So remember that. I want to reduce judgment, analysis, criticism, and being hard on myself, non-acceptance, because I know that that stresses my system. That causes me stress, and we surely don't want to be elevating our cortisol, right? If we have something that is, we know, our immune system being boosted is going to be more helpful to myself, then I'm going to catch myself the next time I catch myself judging myself or someone else because I know it hurts me. This is a practice of self-love. And a practice of self-love means I'm going to trust that that big guy up there, woman or essence, God, source, Buddha, Jesus, Allah, the saints, that that wisdom of the universe knows why this is happening. I don't have to spend hours asking why. Why did I have to get into a car accident just three days after I bought my new car? I'm in the car accident, it's happening, and I breathe. This is what I did. It's a true story, I just bought my car, three days later I'm in an accident. And literally, as I know I'm gonna, this person's gonna hit me, I did my sniffs. Because I know that in this moment, I have a choice. I can love myself, I can help heal myself, I can be my best friend, or I can react. I can hurt myself with my thoughts. I can lower my vibration, I can lower my immune system. There's only two paths. There's the love path, the healing path, the good digestion path, the growing path, that's oxytocin. And then there's the chronically stressed path. Don't like myself, I'm not good enough, this is wrong with me. Um, just, there's just two ways that the system can, can function, and that's cortisol. And the thing is, stress is not a bad thing. How many people here think stress is bad? So stress is actually great if there's a nail that's in my foot, because I'm going to react to that. If something's going to fall on me, I'm going to have to move really fast. So if I'm being threatened under short-term duration, we're designed to run away, we're designed to protect ourselves, right? So we need to have stress hormone. It's not a bad thing. But when I'm constantly creating stress in my body, uh, a perception of feeling threatened, which sometimes it's my own self creating that, that's not healthy. So we were meant to be under stress under short-term duration, not long-term duration. But we might feel like that because, Michelle, my legs don't move the way I want them to. So here's the thing. You're going to be walking, right? But there's moments where you start to feel like you just can't do it anymore, but you push yourself more. Anybody do that? But your body's trying to say, hello, I need a break. But you got to go shopping. You got to get that one more thing, right? So it's really important for people with the diagnosis of MS to pace themselves. And this is a way of loving ourselves. Your body's trying to communicate with you 24 seven. So when your body's starting to give you signs that you need to take a break, you're gonna honor that. Because then your body's just gonna go on strike. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? So those are the moments when you're feeling drained, tired, exhausted, you're catching yourself ruminating in your thoughts. You can literally breathe in, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been dwelling on not loving you enough. To yourself, like just start to dialogue with your body and let yourself know, I love you. So massage is really helpful for yourself. The deep breaths and the intention 
I'm going to, from this moment on, I am my greatest cheerleader. I am my best friend. I am healthy. Optimal. Optimal health, those words. I am optimally healthy. Those are really powerful words. And there's many different things I could have spoken about today. And I hope that you got a little message of something. Um, if you can, visit me at michellealva.com. That's my website. And there's a free gift there. If you go on there and put your name and email, there's an e-guide I wrote called Top 10 Tips for Stress-Free Day. And also a guided meditation called Let Go and Live. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope to connect with you soon. Thank you, Michelle. By the way, I'm going to put up on our site information about all three of their sites so that if anybody wants to contact them afterwards, you'll be able to contact them. But in the meantime, who has questions for one of these ladies? Over there. <laughs> anybody coming up on, from the right side of the room so I could get Maria over to you? One of my questions is, what are the effects of heating or steaming vegetables? Does it detract from their nutritional benefits? So, the question was, um, does cooking or heating up vegetables detract from the benefits? Is that correct? Actually, some benefits, like I had mentioned before, um, benefits of the vegetables come out when you heat the food. For example, the lycopene was the example that I used in tomatoes. So sometimes cooking or heating up the food can actually increase the health benefit. In some cases, it, it might not change it. You know, cooking or steaming vegetables, baking, roasting, the nutrients are fairly much maintained in that process when you boil vegetable, for example, you might lose some of the nutrients in the cooking water, but you can use that as like a, a broth for me for something else. But most of the time, um, cooking, you will not lose a huge amount of nutrients. There was a question over here about fruit, and if you keep it in the refrigerator, it diminishes the nutrient value. I haven't actually read any, any evidence of that. I know living here in South Florida, the fruit and veggies decay so fast if you leave them out that typically once the fruit is at its ripeness, stick it in the fridge and you can enjoy it for an extra few days. But losing nutritional value, I don't believe so. There's a... Um, hello, hello um, good afternoon. I want to ask you a question. You said the only way we can, we can benefit from the, from the lycopene in, um, in, in tomatoes is if, to, if, you, if you cook it. That's the only way you can utilize the lycopene in it? There was a question about um, tomatoes and the lycopene. Can you repeat that, please? Now, I was asking you, the only way you could you, um, benefit from the lycopene of tomatoes if you cook it only? Yes. Yeah, it's activated upon actually heating up the tomato or tomato products. So it can be either fresh tomatoes or tomato puree, canned tomatoes, stewed, potato, stewed tomatoes in a can. You activate it by actually heating it up. Yes. You're welcome. All right, who's next? Uh, I've done acupuncture before, and it is fantastic. How many times a month would you recommend? Yes, speak louder. How many times a month would you recommend acupuncture? Okay. The question is, how many times a month would you recommend would acupuncture be recommended? You know, it's on a case by case um, basis. It really depends on the patient. It's a little hard to assess without doing an initial intake. Everyone is at a different place, so uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a precise answer. Okay, my name is Yolanda, and uh, my question is for the dietary. I did a complete change. I did a complete change in how my eating habits. I ended up dropping a lot of things with MSG and a lot of things with gluten, and that worked a lot. I increased a lot on my, uh, my greens and my vegetables and my fruits and I noticed a difference also I felt like it helped me also um, with my 
incontinence, if, if one wants to say, because your body does go through changes. Um, however, my concern is, can I be totally off meats and become vegan and, and it'll be okay? Or do I always have to find you know, a way to, to have the meats? That's a great question. Um, should choosing a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle inhibit any kind of um, d be determined, be detrimental to your health? No, actually, uh, there has been many tons of data on vegetarian and vegan lifestyles actually creating or pre preventing other chronic illnesses. So hypertension, heart disease, which is the number one killer in, in the United States, um, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. These can, things can actually be prevented if you choose a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle. It's not for everyone and it's not really required for everyone. You can still get um, you could still have a healthy diet if you choose lean meats, low-fat dairy, um, and include those in your meal plan. But yes, if you choose to have a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, just make sure that you're, you're getting adequate protein and adequate fat. Who's up? Are, are right there. Out there? Uh, this is for dietitian. What uh, what is the truth about avoiding milk products, dairy products? Uh, what is the connection with dairy products and MS? The question was about dairy products and MS. So, like I had mentioned before, there is some research on a low saturated fat diet helping to prevent the uh, onset of disease, and also if it's if you already have MS, to prevent the um, the progression. So if you're choosing dairy free, if you're choosing dairy, make sure it's low fat or no fat. When you take out the fat, you're removing also the cholesterol. And a lot of times the animal, if the animal is eating something that has toxins in it, if they're fed not a great quality food, those toxins remain in the fat of that animal, right? So then you'd be taking that in. So low saturated fat dairy products, low fat yogurt, low fat cottage cheese is fine. Um, those things, again, you want to use sparingly. They should make up the majority of your intake, but you can include them small amounts even on a daily basis. Yes, there's a lot going on now about GMOs. Um, what does that have to do with uh, dairy products and, and any of your foods that are so-called healthy and organic? The question about GMOs, if you're saying if the animal itself was fed some kind of feed that had been genetically modified or been giving medication, I mean, there is not a whole lot of evidence to show. There was a study came out of Stanford last year that, sh that uh, compared conventional foods and organic non-GMO foods to the nutritional quality, and they showed the nutritional value being the same. But as far as long-term effect of consuming these products that have been genetically modified or altered in any way is unknown, right? So what I would recommend is try to f choose uh, f the foods that are on that typically have very high amounts of genetically modified, like corn, soy, wheat, cattle, chicken. Those things you want to you want to purchase organic. Save your money for those and other things that haven't really had a lot of genetically modified or a lot of hormones added like bananas, avocados, broccoli, those things you can buy conventional and save your money for the others. The, the, typically, if you're choosing animal, pro, animal proteins, you want to choose those that are organic and hormone free, right? If you choose a dairy milk, cow's milk, you want to get that organic, right? and vegetables. The, um, the Environmental Working Group has a, great, uh, has a great page on their website that gives you the dirty dozen, the foods that have been shown to have the highest pesticides. Those things you want to kind of be careful of. The things, the fruits and veggies with very thin skins, they tend to get a lot of pesticides. Uh, they might not be genetically modified, but they do have a lot of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides that are used in the in production of those. But if you're choosing animal products, try to choose hormone-free, grass-fed if you're including cow's milk in your in your diet and um, grass-fed cow or grass-fed buffalo if you're choosing that to include in your diet as well. 
Okay, from the internet, somebody asked, by the way, I don't have a microphone. You see, they took it away. Do you have one? No, I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. What forms of massage do you recommend for people with constant spasticity? S Swedish massage is very nice, and Indian massage, relaxation massage. They're slow and rhythmical, repetitive movements because those are the ones that stimulate oxytocin. If you are too hard with pressure, it might stimulate spasticity and increasing the muscle tone. So the, uh, something else that's really important is that you really like the therapist that you're working with because believe it or not, sometimes we're receiving massages and we don't feel completely comfortable and relaxed. So oxytocin works best when you trust and feel safe. And this is something where loving whatever it is that you're doing, whatever healing modalities, don't do it because somebody's telling you to do it. It's really important that you are consciously making the decision and it feels in alignment with your authentic self. And we ourselves can massage our tummy and our chest. We have the most receptors for oxytocin on the chest and on the abdomen. So simply doing rhythmical repetitive movements with medium pressure, you can use coconut oil is great, and, and with a loving intention to yourself every morning when you wake up, you can do that, and it doesn't cost you anything. And the intention is 90% of the benefit. So loving your internal organs, feeling grateful for your spleen that produces those white blood cells, you're you know, putting in this self-nurturing practice is very, very helpful. All right, great. This is for the um, nutritionist. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I hear a lot of people say the microwave. The microwave causes that you take away a lot of your uh, vitamins and everything else. And I want to know, um, is that true? The microwave, is the microwave evil or not? Um, <laughs> No, I mean, again, there is not a lot of evidence showing that it's really detrimental to your food. It's more of a comfort factor, I think. If you prepare, would like to prepare your food, it's on the stove. Um, it's more of a connection with the food than just heating something up in the microwave. But not to my knowledge, it's not harmful in any way. Okay, one, one moment. Okay, you first, and then I'll do the internet question. Okay, for Jane, you're not getting any questions there, so let, let's... <laughs> Uh, but as far as for the acupuncture, uh, the needles and whatnot, how far do they go in? Is there ever any uh, cases of uh, infection or anything? And also, how well do the insurance companies cover your therapy? Okay. The question was about um, the acupuncture, about the needles, how far they go, and uh, insurance companies. Uh, first of all, um, it's important to note that if you're going to have acupuncture done, you should be using a board certified acupuncture physician. There are other uh, alternative medicine practitioners, chiropractors, there's also some PAs that take some continuing education courses on acupuncture for a week or two weeks, and they are practicing acupuncture. A board certified acupuncture physician studies Chinese medicine at a graduate level for four years, takes clinical hours, and sits for a national board exam. With that said, if you are using a board certified acupuncture physician, there should be no incident of infection. There should be no uh, incident of any dangerous placement of needles. As far as the depth of the needle, it really depends on where the needle is being placed. If we're placing a needle on the wrist, it's pretty shallow and it's usually at an angle more oblique. If we're going into the gluteal area, we have to go a little deeper to affect the energy in the chi. No, not necessarily. And as far as the insurance companies go, um, unfortunately, the insurance companies don't pay as well as we would like. Some of the insurance companies do pay for acupuncture. We're seeing a little bit of more of a movement in that direction, but it's really, uh, we have to check each individual insurance policy as we come upon it. Thank you. So I had an internet question. I wonder if this guy sent me the email because the question was the same thing. How long are the needles? 
Uh, okay, we, we, have, we have a visual in the back of the room how large the needles are about this, no. Uh, the needles vary um, in length. Of course, if we're doing a needle on the face, it could be very, very small, like a quarter of an inch. Something going into the gluteal area could be about a two inch needle, but the entire needle would not go into the body. There's a handle on the needle. Um, I actually have some needles if anybody wants to see, but the depth is really not that great, to be honest, in many situations. To some extent, yes, that is true. And there's also a different heaviness of gauge, depending on where we're using the needle. That We use different gauges. Right here. Uh, two part question. One about the wild type salmon, as opposed to, I guess, farm salmon, and also with oxytocin. Is that for both males and females that it, that will happen? Because I was always thinking of oxytocin as a female hormone. I'll, I'll answer the first question about the omega-3 and omega-6 in farm rays versus uh, wild salmon. So there was a question, which one is best, the wild cold water fish like salmon or the farm rays? Typically the farm raised fish are fed corn, believe it or not, that's very high in omega-6, which is a pro-inflammatory fat. The wild caught cold water fish, they have very high amounts of omega-3. That's why you hear salmon, halibut, cod, those kind of fish. Very high amounts of fat, omega-3, anti-inflammatory. Really important to get a dose of that almost every single day uh, through either cold water fish, flax seeds, walnuts, especially for autoimmune patients. Super important. If you choose a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, you have to supplement with omega-3 unless you're taking flaxseed, uh, flaxseed, walnuts, things like that to give you that, to um, give you adequate amount of omega-3. So that's the main difference when you hear about cold water, uh, wild caught fish and farm raised fish is the omega fats, pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory. And men and women both secrete oxytocin, produce it. It's the love hormone, the healing hormone. It's a hormone that helps us to focus and it makes us feel energized. Anybody who's been in love or who has a pet, like my little doggy, I'm constantly in love just watching her. Um, we feel more energized, we feel lighter. We don't really, nothing really affects us when we're in love, right? We're, um, what's that word? The, we're protected in a way. It's really amazing. You don't experience pain a person that is in love and steps on a little tack on the floor is not going to care about the pain, is not going to hurt you as much as somebody who's chronically stressed out and really not being healthy with their self-relationship. You know, they've done studies with the low back and as a physical therapist I know this where people have arthritis and they have no cartilage in their joints and they have no pain. And then there's people that have more cartilage and have a lot of pain. So pain is very, very much influenced by how much cortisol and oxytocin you have circulating in your body. That's why I do lectures teaching people how to become oxytocin experts. And you can Google oxytocin and Michelle Alva. I've written articles in my blog, very, very fun, and just teaching you ways to do this yourself. And for example, heart hugs, hugging people, looking into people's eyes, your partners, just literally smiling. When you go out in the sun and you feel that high from just being in the sun, that's oxytocin. When you get a massage, when you're in the heat, in the st um, for, for MS, that's the thing where heat is not sometimes recommended. Um, but if you ever have just experienced a steam bath or being in a jacuzzi in the past, it makes you feel more relaxed. And also laughing. So there's... It, when you feel full after a meal, you secrete oxytocin. Wine makes us secrete oxytocin. So I can go on forever talking about this. <laughs> but there's different ways that you can do that. And it is men and women. It's every living, every living a animal secretes the love hormone. It's really interesting. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? We're not finished yet. We're One not more. Finished yet. There's more. We still have a few more questions to go here. All right, over here first. Hi, um, I've chosen to go vegan recently. Can't hear you. 
I've chosen to go vegan recently, and um, is Bragg's amino acid a good way to get protein? Bragg's liquid aminos? Amino acids. Amino acids. Basically, that is used as a condiment, as a replacement for soy sauce for people that are trying to reduce their intake of sodium. There's not a ton of, of protein in that, actually. The advertising's a little bit funny on that one. Thank you, because that's what I thought. Thanks. Okay, as far as the acupuncture needles go, they are single-use disposable needles. Okay, they're individually wrapped. We use them once and they get picked up by a biohazardous waste company. Okay, over here, please. Yes, for Jane, um, you talked about the qualifications of acupuncturists, but uh, what's the best way, uh, sort of similarly to the idea that you'd like to get a massage from somebody you're comfortable with, having an acupuncture treatment with somebody you feel comfortable with or is highly qualified or highly referred, how do you recommend going about finding um, somebody like that? That's a great question. The question was, how do you go about finding someone to give you acupuncture treatment that you feel a connection with, that you feel comfortable with? Um, in my practice, I do a complimentary consultation. If someone's interested in having an acupuncture treatment in my office, I invite them to come to the office. I set aside 15, 20 minutes. We meet, we discuss what the health issues are, and we basically discuss if I think that I can help you or not, if I think acupuncture is a good option for you. And that's sort of a meet and greet, a good time uh, to get to know each other a little bit, because it it is an energy work, you know, and I agree it's very important that there's some sort of level of comfort. Next question. Sir. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, one for the acupuncturist and one for the nutritionist. Um, I've heard from my acupuncturist that flaxseed uh, for males can help increase or de actually it's bad for the prostate. I don't know if that's true or not. And, uh, well, that's what I'm saying. It came from the, from her. She said there have been studies that the flaxseed oil is not great, and I, I, I don't like fish, so omega is an issue for me. And the other question for the acupuncturist is the Chinese the Chinese herbs, uh, and they're not their efficacy as much as the control for the production of the herb that we're not using these artificial, not artificial, but you hear so much about the Chinese lack of the Western belief of hey. Let's not use D DHT or DDT or all those negative things. How can we buy the best in the Chinese herbs? Those are the two questions. I'll take the flaxseed question first. Um, I think that what you had heard, there was an article very recently that came out about super supplementing with, uh, with flaxseed oil. Um, it was in a peer reviewed journal and they, they had illustrated some large amount of supplementation with flaxseed. I can't remember the, the amount, but yeah, it did show to have some negative effect on the prostate, but it was super supplementation. So it's like many other things, all the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K. So vitamin D, if you're super supplementing, those vitamins stay, they stay in the fat as opposed to water soluble, B and C, where you just eliminate it through your urine. So anything that you super supplement, yeah, it can have um, a, 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 a toxic effect. I can't remember, I can't recall exactly what level that was. That's correct. But a daily intake of flaxseed or any other thing with omega-3 um, should actually have positive health benefits. Maria. Oh, yes. That's okay. Okay. The, the second part of the question was about the quality of Chinese herbs, which is definitely a concern. Um, you know, when you're looking at Chinese herbs, there are herbs that come directly from China. We call them patent formulas. You'll look at the bottle and you'll see the Chinese writing on the bottle. There's really no quality control as far as we're concerned when you look at those herbs. If you're uh, having Chinese herbs that are prescribed by a licensed acupuncture physician who is purchasing those herbs, generally from a company in the United States who sources the herbs and has very high uh, quality control standards, that's safe. I think that the patent formulas are definitely concerning and I would stay away from them. And I also recommend having a uh, acupuncture physician who's licensed to prescribe the herbs for you. Yes, hi, I have two questions. One is about the acupuncture. 
What's the worst side effect that happen, can happen with that? Can you get nerve damage if someone puts one of the needles into a nerve? And two, the second one is about diet. Someone had downloaded some from information to me about a swank diet that's MS related. And I don't see a lot of, when you go to the seminars, they talk about a real MS diet. So the swank diet is like less meat, cod liver oil, and things of that sort. The question was about um, the potential dangers of acupuncture and possibly uh, damaging a nerve, or I guess one of the worst uh, possibilities. You know, we really don't see incidents of nerve damage. The worst of the worst, which would be something that would unfortunately happen uh, if a someone who is not a professional and not well trained would be a pneumothorax, would be uh, an acupuncture needle, you know, that goes through the lung. And honestly, we don't hear about those things happening with licensed acupuncture physicians because that is a huge part of our training, understanding the placement of needles and uh, the anatomy. That's why I stress that you really need to see a board certified acupuncture physician. Someone who's trained sort of casually on a continuing education basis would not be a good choice. Hi, take, thank you. Uh, um, thank you for being here. Um, oh, okay, I'm ready. Swank diet. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I can, I'll take the swank diet question and then we can move on. But yeah, for those, uh, you probably have read maybe a little bit about Dr. Roy Swank. He recently passed away, actually. But he was a neurologist that studied MS patients for over 34 years. And um, he was observing the amount of saturated fat that those patients were taking in. He put them on a very, very low saturated fat diet, um, very heavy plant-based diet, low, low saturated fat, and found over the course of all those years that those patients had much slower progression, significantly slower progression of MS. So I guess that um, if you've talked to some of the, <laughs> why are you laughing? I <laughs> um, So if you've received some of that information from your physicians, you know, it's, it's good to kind of investigate and read about it, but the diet in general is healthy as far as preventing other chronic illness as well, right? Yes, I did it for a year. I was just wondering why we don't talk about it much when we go into the seminars. The reason why it's not really given a whole lot of credibility is because it wasn't a controlled study, right? It controlled, um, had, he, had, he had one group that was put on a very low saturated fat diet, but he didn't have a control group, right? So a lot of times when you, have, when you try to get these articles into publication, it's, uh, you know, the peer reviewed journals, it, there's certain kind of structure on how to do research studies. And he didn't really follow that specific those specific guidelines. He put one group of people without a control on a, on a particular diet. So maybe that's one reason why it's not discussed a whole lot um, at, these, at these workshops, only because of that limitation right there. Okay, we have time just for another. And it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, nobody, none of you have talked about it, but does any, do, any of you three beautiful women have any information on reflexology? You know, the benefits of reflexology, because um, I've experienced once and it was like out of body and it really made a big impact on me and I'd like to do it again. So, got any comment there? Did you like the therapist? Oh, love the therapist. See, this is something funny. You know, I'm a physical therapist for 18 years, but you, I am at my best at age 40. And I have to say, the, the miraculous things that happen in healing sessions, I know that the hard work that I do, the food that I eat, the thoughts that I digest, the emotions that I process, it is so powerful. We are so powerful as healers for ourselves. The way oxytocin works is when I am in a loving state of acceptance and I forgive and all these things that I talk about, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing because my magnetic field, my aura, is healing everyone, everywhere. So even the needles, yes, we have meridians, reflexology, I do, I know all the points on the foot, but I just wanna say that regardless of what the technique is, the person that is the facilitator of that experience is healing you and 
that's why it's so important to just notice that and what are you bringing into it. So reflexology is wonderful because you can affect the whole body through the feet, through the hands and the ears. But let's not forget that that relationship you have with this person, it's so important, just like your doctor, your spouse, your friends. So I just want to bring that up too. But yes, that's on another wonderful modality. And there's many things you can do. Aquatic therapy, as a physical therapist, we work in the water. That is a wonderful medium to work for people with multiple sclerosis because you only weigh 10% of you know, your body weight. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Any, any form of massage that is helping you to relax is very, very helpful. Okay, we're going to have time for two more questions. One minute. And again, if anybody has additional questions for either of these women, bring your questions to me. We'll have them answer them. We'll post them up on the blog like we're going to do with the physician's questions or answers. Okay? Two more. Okay, we're this is for uh, Jane. Um, I had an accident before I was diagnosed with diabetes. I mean with uh, MS, <laughs> my, my child has diabetes. But um, I was doing acupuncture like three times a week and I was absolutely in love with it. And then because of this pain disorder I had, I had a bad experience with the acupuncturist and I thought that I could never do that again. And I'm wondering, since you said that you really ra rarely see any problems with that or any side effects, if I could start going back to acupuncture again because I absolutely loved it, especially in the ear and the way it made me feel all over was great, great experience. Okay, I'm not sure that I heard the whole uh, part of the question. You had a uh, negative experience, you said? Yes. Uh, okay, but you didn't say what it was? I'm sure, I, I really didn't hear the whole. It was um, extreme pain. Extreme And pain. I don't know if it was from my pain disorder or from the acupuncture, but it scared me off. Okay, sometimes uh, when patients are experiencing uh, pain conditions and they go for any kind of alternative healing, sometimes we have what we call a healing crisis and sometimes you can see a little bit of an escalation in the pain. If it's something that was a little more enduring than a, a, a short flare, you know, I would be curious as to why. Um, I think that it's important, again, that you seek someone who's very qualified. It's very hard to judge from one experience with one practitioner, but it sounds like what you experienced was not the norm. It was, it was pretty isolated, unfortunately. All right, so, uh, we're down to one mic. I have to speak or they won't hear me being told. So anyway, one question, where are we? Yeah, now we have one and a half um, questions. I, I, got a question got a for, I, want, I have a question for Jane about acupuncture. My first question is, if, if I want to pay for it out of pocket, how much would it be? And, you know, how much, that's, I only got one question. How much would it be out of pocket? The question is, if uh, you were to be paying for an acupuncture treatment out of pocket, what the cost would be. The first session, which is a longer visit, because when we do an intake, it's not a quick intake. Remember, as I mentioned in the presentation, we want to get an idea of what's going on in the entire body, because everything's very interconnected. So the first visit with the intake and the treatment, and then sort of a sit down and go over some recommendations afterwards, is about an hour and a half to two hours. It depends on the complexity of the patient. The average for that visit is about 120 twenty dollars and then the follow-up visits are a little bit shorter and they're generally about ninety dollars that's the average in Miami I'm sorry say that again you asked about I do accept insurance if the insurance pays for acupuncture treatment yes all right again for all that we're gonna put it up on the website all right for everybody so that way we can just have it posted of all their addresses, their emails, their, their websites, whatever. You'll be able to find each of them, okay? Last question. No, he wants to imitate the Rocky There you go. This probably is a lengthy answer, but I'll try and make a short question. 1930s was the discovery of MS. Um, with the discovery, it seems like the timeline coincides with the outlawing of hemp. And I'm wondering if there is a higher incidence of MS since the 1930s, since hemp was taken out of our food supply. And being hemp has all, its, pro, its profile has all the amino acids that we need in our body. 
was a question about um, the industrialization of food and the increased rates of MS. Yeah, I mean, I have, from what I understand, they, the more industrialized nations do have higher incidence of MS. That is true. I can't tell you exactly what is going on with the food supply, you know, the food industry, the major changes that were happening around World War II. But um, there were definitely changes in the manufacturing of the foods. And um, I can't really explain any, anything more. There's not a whole lot of concrete evidence on that. But it has definitely been recognized that those rates were going up in parallel. Industrialization of food during the Second World War and um, increased rates of, of this autoimmune disease and autoimmune disease in general. Okay, thank you, ladies. And I'm presenting Melissa and Michelle and Jane with our certificates of appreciation. Thank you again. For our next and final speaker of the day, we're going to have Jeffrey Siegel, who's a personal trainer. And Jeffrey's going to come up and do adaptive exercise mobility for MS. And we're going to have to take down these tables because Jeffrey's program is interactive. So while they're putting everything down on the ground, we're going to run a raffle again. First one, for a tablet, for an Android tablet. Okay, and this is courtesy of MS Views and News. Again, mixing it up. Number is 339923. Yay! <laughs> we have a yay on the other side of the room. The next one, we're going to do another gift certificate since we have time here. And that is for a free luncheon donated by the Intercontinental Hotel. And so, with a mixture of numbers, we've got 339922. What is that? Where are we? 22. Two. Is that your number? There you go. All right, and since they're still moseying on around here, what do we got? We got a book on MS. MS tips, multiple sclerosis, 300 tips. Number 399957. 957. 957 is going gone in the back. That way. Polar. Polar Products gave us a cooling device for your neck or somewhere. It's somewhere. I don't know where it goes for sure. I don't want to open it. All right. And that will be number... Got to mix them up. Look like they're all in a row here. 339897. 897. 897. That over there. Thank you. I got to get somebody to take this thing down. Angel, can you give a hand here? Nothing. All right, next one. Go for it. Next one is, well, that's pretty cool. We're self-sufficient. All right, so for the next one, we're going to do the Polar Cooling Product Vest. Okay? Polar Cooling Products has donated a vest. And... We have number 339857. That's good. <laughs> number 340000. 340000. It's a good thing because. The vest is an extra large. It'll go with that guy. <laughs> All right. At the end of the program, we're going to do our final raffle prize, which is going to be another Android tablet. So now you have to still stay here until we're done. You're up.
And so we're going to start with Jeffrey Siegel. You ready? Can you hear me? Hello. How's everybody doing today? I'm happy you stayed this long because if not, it'd be an empty room and it'd be more difficult, but there'd be more room to run. Everybody having a good time? I'm very impressed with the speakers that we've had so far, so I hope I can live up to what they've brought to the table. I'm going to ask for some participation from some people throughout the program, but if you do participate, you have to give, uh, you're okay to be on film. You have to have consent. So before coming up here, remember this is live, and these programs do not work without all of you guys. Okay, I'm here because you're here. If you weren't here, I'd have nowhere to be. <laughs> How many people in here exercise? Okay, great. You got, this is a great crew of people. I mean, I've never seen that many people raise their hands when I've asked that question. So either this is the right group to be speaking to or a lot of you aren't telling the truth, which I, I hope the first one is the, tr is the right answer. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is, if you participate, I want to make sure you follow one rule, and that's give 100%. Okay? And I'm not going to ask you to do something you can't do, and if I do, don't, just don't do it. So. Raise your hands as high as you can possibly raise them. Now, raise your hands this much higher. Okay, put your hands down. That is very significant, this much, because if this much is more than what you can possibly do, which I first asked you originally, then you guys are missing out on a lot. You gotta find out what it takes to get you to do this much more, or a lot more than this much. When it comes to exercise, it's easy to make excuses. It's easy to take that route of not doing it because you're afraid of what might happen. Well, what might happen is you might feel better. And most people who have MS, who do not exercise, have that fear that something's gonna happen. Now, if someone paid you to exercise, how many of you would exercise if you're not exercising? Right? That's, is there a bigger incentive in life than money, I mean, that's universal. Good health, I mean, that should be way ahead of that. Uh, now, if I were to tell you I have $10,000 in my pocket for the first person that can raise their hand two feet higher than that, what would you do? Yeah. All right, so what I'm saying, what I'm trying to show you is there's always gonna be obstacles. It doesn't change your goal. It doesn't change, it may change the direction that it takes to get to your goal, but the goal remains the same. You just gotta find a way to do it. And that's what exercise is. Find a way to do something that's gonna work for you. I'm gonna show you a lot of types of exercises, a lot of modalities. I've got a whole gym full of exercise equipment right here. And the common, what's common with most of it is it's inexpensive and most important, it's safe. And most of you can do most of what's here. So what I'm gonna do is start out with Exercise balls. I've got all different types of them up here. Uh, what I try to do with exercise is work on all planes. All planes, without getting specific, is this way, this way, and this way. Right? And it, to improve what you're doing, I add level changes, you know, and rotation, and all the different pillars of movement. Uh, you want to increase what you're doing. And that's what exercise all, is all about. It's a progressive activity. So if you start out here, the goal is to work your way up to here. It takes time. Anybody in here ever run a marathon? That's great. There's, there's a couple people raising their hands. If any of you, is there anyone in here who would like to run a marathon? I would like to. I'm not going to do it, but I would, I would like to. But I wouldn't run the marathon right off the bat. I wouldn't leave here and run a marathon because it doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of hard work. And, if I, and the people who did not raise your hand when I asked to exercise, uh, did any of you think about why you don't exercise? You don't have to raise your hand because you didn't raise your hand the first time. Um, but a lot of the times people use excuses and they trick themselves out of doing it. And what I hear most of the time is where you used to be and what you used to be able to do. Did anybody have that cross their mind? Yeah, 
And it's great because what you used to be able to do made you who you are today. And did you think about where you were at your very best when I said that? Because that comes to my mind. If somebody asks me if you do something at the gym, I, I try to veer away from that in my head of thinking, okay, well, there was a time that I was able to bench around 400 pounds, but I can't do it now, so I'm not going to the gym. Or squat 500 pounds, or run this fast, or do any of those things. But when you break it down, it's not the outcome that is as profound as what it took to get there. Okay, hard work, right? You didn't learn the alphabet by just being given the alphabet on a piece of paper, reading it and doing it. You gotta work your way to it. So, exercise is something that, you know, like I said, has to be safe. I'm gonna start with some simple things. Now, if there's anybody who wants to participate, like I said, not with just the raising your hand, but actually coming up here, there's gonna be a time for it. Um, I, I really, if you can sit on a stability ball, this is a stability ball. Stability ball, Swiss ball, uh, you name it. Anybody have any other names for it? Yoga ball. It's a big balance ball. It's, it's, they're all, it's the same thing. So if you can sit on this, you can do some simple exercises just by moving around. Just rotating, internal, external hip flexion, um, all those things are helpful to a warm up and that's at the very beginning. Then I like to get people moving around more. If you can't stand up, then standing up's not gonna be what we're gonna do. Maybe something similar to it. Is there anybody in here who cannot do a squat but can stand up? If you cannot do squats but you can stand. I see some hands up, you guys are selling yourself short. Because if you can stand up and sit down, unless you're never going to stand up again, you can do a squat. And if you do it twice, you've done two. And if you have to have something such as a table to do it on, you just go from here to here, and that becomes a squat. But don't, don't look at what's right in front of you. If it, if it takes something to get to and it's not right there in front of you, you can still get there. Remember, just change your path a little bit, and it'll become a little more... Uh, accessible or easy to do. So this is the stability ball. I like to sit on this at the computer, at the dinner table. You can do exercise while you're sitting on it. So anything that you do, such as some bands and some, um, some other stuff that you will see, you can do sitting on the ball as long as you can balance on the ball. Uh, if you can't, then... about it, Just about everything I have up here you can do in a seated position. So everybody in here for the most part, from here forward, is in a seated position. So you guys are all candidates. Now there's some uh, other things that you can do with this. And I'm gonna move along with this. Um, bear with me. If you can't go all the way down doing this, you don't go all the way down doing it. You can start right here. This is a squat. If you can go further down, better to you, all, all the world to you, but you, you just keep adding something to it. If going down all the way isn't gonna tire you out or it's not gonna be too difficult, you can add some resistance. This is a medicine ball. Or add some uh, complex movements, compound Now the other thing about exercise that I didn't say at the beginning, which might be the most important thing, is I'll say it in the form of a question. How many of you would exercise more if it was fun? How many in here do not like having fun? Right? Everybody likes having fun. Some people, it's been longer than others. But if I ask everybody in here when the last time you had fun or had a good time and you say something that was longer ago than yesterday, we need to talk. Because you gotta enjoy life. This is your only chance at it, right? You get one shot at it, you do it right, there's just gonna be some bumps, but you get the most out of it. That's the way it is. All right, I'm gonna move on to some other types of exercise balls. I'm gonna go up to, I showed you the medicine ball, I showed you the stability ball. This is a small medicine ball. Two pounds, anybody, I want two people up here that give consent 
that are okay with being on video? Two people. Come on up. Come on down. Before I go into the medicine balls, I'm going to use these, the bouncy balls. A big 97 cents at Walmart. Everybody in here, can you afford it? If you can't, the person next to you probably can. <laughs> what? Yeah, you, you give consent to, yeah, okay, come on up. You as well? You, okay. Now, here are the rules. You see that smile you got? Oh, yeah. Keep it. Okay. Don't, lo don't lose that. That's the most important. You're, you've already accomplished most of what I was setting out to do. Can you do stuff standing? Yeah. Okay. Do you want a seat or do you want to stand? Um, I'll give you, actually, yeah. can you sit on a stability ball? Um, I will find out. No, I'm not, we're not going to find out. There's too many people watching. <laughs> <laughs> sit in the chair right, right. here. <laughs> okay. Oh, gotta be quick. Here. I'm taking the smiley face one. Okay. J throw it to me. Throw that to me. Here. Okay, now what I want you to do is, now we're gonna get something that's more uniform. You guys see they're having fun. I just wanna see you can have fun. That's movement. If you're sitting around wondering what you're gonna do next, move while you're wondering. What I want you to do is, you throw it high, you throw it low. And I want you to just try it. No, at the same time. Here, watch. I'll try it with you. Um, go ahead. Throw it high. I'll throw it low. OK. Anybody see how big her smile is? Get it, get it, get it. OK. Look. There you go. No. <laughs> no, you don't have to run after it. I'm just getting fancy. But, but not only was she smiling, but you guys were all smiling. And you weren't laughing at her. You were laughing with her, right? OK. Um, now, if I wanted to make it a little bit more difficult, we add something to it. Here. You got that? No, that's two pounds. Do you want to try it first? First thing is, here, let me see. Can you catch this? Okay, now it's going to get really strange because you're going to have different weighted things. Throw it. We know what the worst thing's going to happen is she's not going to catch it. And, and she'll, she'll recover okay from it. Yeah, you throw the high, you throw the It's okay. Now, now you have nothing but improvement to do. Everything's going to be an improvement, so go. Ah, there we go. You see? Already got some improvement. Okay. Now, there's other things that you can do. You can do it with a bounce. And if you're alone, it's reaction. You know, coordination, reaction, hand-eye coordination. Throw it up against the wall, try to catch it. Throw it up against the wall, try to catch it. If you can, if you can do more than that, throw it backwards against the wall, try to catch it. Um, okay, thank you guys for coming up here. I'll have some other things for other people to do, but thanks. Something that, that we may lack is called proprioception. Does anybody in here know what proprioception is? Proprioception is where you are in space. Your ability to understand where you are in space, like when you step, when you reach, when you move, you got the signals that go down and back and forth that tell you. If you don't have proprioception, then you may step and your knee may come in here and you may fall over. And so, so gradually, proprioception can increase. Uh, you can nearly adapt to exercise or movements. Uh, and here's a complex one that I was, uh, was going to show you further into the talk, but. If you can balance, now balancing is important if you want to have good balance. I think stability is more important because we live stable. It's, it, the way we stand, the more stable we are, the better stability we have, the better we can function. Uh, anybody in here sports fans? Okay, can you think of more than one sport that there's not a ready position in? This is the ready position. Anyone? I can't. I mean, it depends what you consider a sport. Cards doesn't count. <laughs> it, it's on ESPN, but it doesn't count as a sport. The ready position is important because it's stable. Stability is a triangle this way. Balance is a triangle this way. And eventually, there's a way that you can possibly, depending on how you're doing, 
um, progress from stability to balance. Now, if you cannot stand up, then that's not something that you would want to try to do, is stand up on one leg and just do that. Um, with medicine balls, I like warming up with medicine balls because, like I said, the medicine balls I use are soft. These ones are. This is a sandbag. It's another modality of exercise. But same things that you can do with a medicine ball, you can do with a sandbag. You drop it on your foot, it makes a loud noise. It doesn't hurt. You can get those from anywhere from like one or two pounds to 50, 60 pounds. Um, one thing that I like doing with all these medicine balls, um, sandbags, anybody in here ever get frustrated? We, we had a whole talk, I was listening about how, all the stuff about stress and cortisol and anybody in here have stress? Okay, whoever didn't raise your hand, come talk to me, I wanna know the answers, <laughs> all right? Stress is just part of life, but stress stays inside your skin. Right? Because if I'm stressed out as could be right now, would you have any clue? You're not going to help it. I mean, if you could, it'd be great. But my stress is trapped inside of me. So how do you get it out? How do you release the stress? Exercise, one of the ways that exercise does help you uh, maintain or keep stress out is you're exercising. You're not sitting there worrying about something. And if you're worried about the exercises that you're doing, have somebody teach them to you. Uh, but this is the way I like to get stress reduced is I call them ball slams. Actually, I'll get a ball to do it with. Got to reach into my bag of tricks here. I'll use a small exercise. Uh, this is five pounds. That's not correct. But if you, if you were to take this, throw it as hard as you can to the ground, feels great. Do it two times, feels even better. Five times you're starting to breathe heavy, 10 times you're breathing even heavier, 15 times you've accomplished it, no more stress. Go to the next exercise, don't stop and think about what was stressing you out. Let's see. This is a bigger medicine ball, it has handles. Uh, some people with MS, and by the way, I forgot to mention this. I get it. I get where you guys are coming from. I know what it feels like to have these words told to you. You have multiple sclerosis. That's what we've come to conclude, that you have multiple sclerosis. I got those words 15 years ago, okay? It took me a couple years to figure out that it's not the end of, the life, of my life. It's the beginning, because every day is a new beginning, right? So if you look at every day as a new beginning, you get so much more out of life. If you look at it as a, and the mornings are the best, right? To some, I mean, I got more energy in the morning. And if you, if you wanna be happy throughout the day, or at least happier, try this. What's the first thing you do in the morning? That, that's a good one. Really, what's the first thing you do in the morning? You go to the bathroom? <laughs> I run for the bathroom. But between bed and the bathroom, is a mirror. And if you can stop for a half a second and look in the mirror and do this, <laughs> you'll get that response out of yourself. You'll laugh at yourself, you'll look back and you'll chuckle and you know what? At the end of the day, you cannot say you didn't smile today. So now you got the rest of the day to gather as much as you can and do more, but your day will start out in a positive way. If you start your day off like this, Let's see who crashed today on the way to work. <laughs> Let's see what was blown up today in another country or in our country or, you know what, that's depressing. Find something that's not so depressing or... Any of you uh, get to the age where, you know, I was talking about having fun and smiling a few minutes ago. Is there ever, any of you that woke up one morning and said, you know what, I'm too old to have fun today can't do it anymore. No, we, we lose it. We start out with PE and, and, and in school we have, what is it, recess? The kids aren't allowed to call it recess anymore. But recess, running around, playing, enjoying it, smiling, playing, all those things. We lose that at some point because we could become busy. And you know what? I was talking to someone the other day that, that I was working with that we, you know, I just heard stuff about weight loss. 
people want to lose weight. Everybody wants to look at their best. And, and again, it just goes back to talking about where you were at your best and you compare yourself. Well, I heard it. I was 125 pounds when I graduated high school. Now I'm 170 pounds. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to work on that. What's your goal? Well, I want to be 125 pounds again. And, I, and in two weeks, I've got a, a big event that I have to do, so I want to lose like 25 pounds by then. Okay, well, how long did it take? This person was almost seven. It was, it was in their 60s. How long did it take you to gain all that weight? If you want to take that weight off between now and two weeks from now, here's a saw. <laughs> Start cutting, because that's the, about the best thing, unless you're going to drain yourself of your fluids and become dehydrated and do all that stuff. So you do it right. You know what? If you want to lose any amount of weight uh, when, a number, when it comes to a number, it should be one pound. Because you can't lose 10, 20, 30 pounds without losing one. So you look at it that way. It's just like walking somewhere. That's another form of exercise is walking. Or if you're in a chair, wheeling yourself somewhere. Or if you're using a walker, using the walker to get somewhere. You, you got to attempt it. You can't be afraid to do it just because of fear. You know, without doing that first step, you'll never know. And what if is garbage? What if goes nowhere? You know, if you spend half as much time as you do wishing for things, as you do wishing for things, you know, if you wish for things half the time of your life, you're not going to get anything. And it's because you spent half your life wishing for stuff. But you got to actually do it. Um, balloons. Usually I show people balloons and they start smiling. It's not my birthday. Anyone in here have a birthday today? Ah, yeah, someone's birthday. This is your balloon. <laughs> I knew it was your birthday. All right, time for more volunteers. Come on up. As long as you're giving consent to be on film in 900 countries. <laughs> okay, maybe not 900, but. Anybody else want to? Actually, I'll have just one person. I want to see one person with a big smile up here. You don't have to wear any silly hats or anything. This falls into the uh, type of exercise mode, modality. Have a seat. Uh, you, okay. Well, actually, no, first have a seat. I'll let you sit on the ball next. Uh, you can put the ball on the seat and sit on that, and then we'll. All right. Uh, this is what I call toys, you know. Toy, exercise equipment can be toys. If you look at exercise as fun, it's not that name and you don't have to worry about, oh, now I gotta exercise, ugh, that word, exercise. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna sit in bed and think about what I can't do the rest of the day and forget about all the things I can do and blah. You're at the end of the day, well, I tried to think about something, no. Know what you can do, that's important. Here, let me see that. Why are you throwing that at me? <laughs> okay, catch it. Ah, catch it. Follow rules. I want you to catch it. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I should have said it louder. Ah. You didn't say that. <laughs> no one heard me say that, did they? I'm on her side. I didn't say it. Okay. Catch it. Okay, now I'm going to hit it back to me. There you go. Now catch it. Look at that. Oh, boop. Hey, let me see it. Have a seat. Stand up and catch it. You hear me say stand up and catch it? I'm on mic, I know. Here, stand up and catch it. You weren't one of those people that couldn't do squats, were you? Well, you're, oh, you could, okay, because she's doing squats as she's standing it, and she's using hand-eye coordination, and it's fun, right? The same thing can be done with, I wouldn't do it on the stability ball, but if you sit on the stability ball, I don't like standing up and sitting down because it could roll away from you. Have a seat on here. Here, I'll hold it. Okay. How you doing there? Good. All right. Yeah, but don't bounce on it. Don't bounce on it. Okay, that's something about exercise is when it's time for you to exercise, you've got to be you. All right? I'm looking around the room at some people with really bad posture. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to turn around back, and everyone's going to have as good a posture as they can possibly have. <laughs> Look at all these people sitting up straight, you know? <laughs> Posture is something that you have to think about. Because at the end of this sentence, as I look around, the same people are already here. 
right? Because you're not thinking about it. If you think about your posture and think about sitting up straight all the time, if you're on a stability ball all the time, all these different things, it becomes learned and you end up being that way. Right? Slouching is going to hurt you. You're going to start out, you're going to end up with rounded shoulders and hip problems, back problems, all sorts of stuff. But, but for the moment here, I just want you guys to be you. Okay? Because if you're thinking about your posture and you're thinking about this, and you're th just be yourself. If you wake up and you be yourself, you, know, take, you don't have to do everything at once. I won't give the whole exercise program in one day and say, okay, now let's see what your max squat is. It doesn't work that way. A lot of things don't work the way some people think. And no pain, no gain. Anyone hear that? No pain, no gain. Right? Wrong. You don't want pain. You exercise and do things so you're not in pain. Yeah, muscle soreness does happen, and, and that's not the kind of pain I mean, but you don't want to hurt yourself exercising, or you'll never exercise again. You got it again. Okay, I'm moving on to some exercise bands. This is a toy. Actually, I'll, I'll give you some, another toy to hold on to while I'm getting some bands out. What I want you to do is this. Just try to get it going like that. Yeah, yeah that doesn't matter. Any, any way you want. Just like you, I'll show you. Just try to get that happen. Yeah. Okay, just keep doing that. Keep doing that. It's buying me time. I'm going to get out the lightest exercise band I have. Okay, give me that back now. It wouldn't have been fair just to keep her sitting there while I was doing this, would it? Not to her, me, or you guys. Okay, these exercise bands are not just the regular ones that come out with, uh, that are one that just go from here to the other side without having something in the middle. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? This piece here is important because you can lock this into a door, you can lock it into a bar, a chair, a piece of exercise equipment, or, so, or someone can hold it. Uh, now it's time to stand up. Yeah. Now when I'm working with people, the most important careful thing, is, aside from safety, is I want people to move better. It's about the movement, not the muscle. If you're moving, the muscle's working. Okay, with MS, there's sometimes conduction failure. You guys ever uh, experienced that? Where if this becomes, and then it becomes this, and then it becomes that. So what I try to do is, you okay there? All right. You're, you're hired too. If, start pulling, both together, pull them back. There you go, one. Two, not up, just keep it straight. Forearms parallel to the ground. Is that difficult? Okay. Now, and what I'm thinking about is that's working her lower back. It's working her upper back. Just by holding it, get in a ready position. Ready. Okay. Just by holding that there, you're working your lower back. So if you just did that every day, just tell it like this, you're exercising, it's an isometric exercise without movement, and she's working her lower back. Okay. Now, <laughs> turn around. Now this is, what I'm gonna have you do is, actually, let me see this. Watch what I do. One thing, one thing about, now you just wait one second. Be patient. Before I forget, because I'm forgetful too. Um, exercise when, when dealing with someone with MS, like myself or like one of you, people are forgetful. So you gotta keep explaining the right way to do it or else they'll do it their own way and it'll have nothing to do with what it started out as, and then you can get hurt. If you're standing and doing this, it's a bench press, right? You guys know what a bench press is? But, it's a, but your feet and are on the ground. So the ground is your base of support, which means your core has to be working in order to maintain an exercise without falling down or wobbling. So, you ready for a bench press? Sure. All right, then you gotta show everybody your muscles. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, palms down, palms down. This is what I want you to do. I just want you to push forward, just like that, with both arms together. Yeah, ready, go. Keep your knees slightly bent. She's working her chest, she's working her shoulders, she's working her abs, she's working her, working her hip flexors. Okay, anyone in here have problems with the hip flexors? Okay, you can stop. I'm done with you right now, but you were, you were great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm still learning the handshakes.
But with these exercise bands, they, go, they come in various sizes and resistance. So you can do progressions. You, know, you can even work on a progression of balance while doing a pull, depending on how your feet are placed on the ground. So if you start out here, and then you slowly go to here, and then to here. Not all at once, but that's, that's a progression. Staggered stance, you know, wide base of support, staggered stance. Or if you're going lateral. You know, how many people in here exercise but do not take lateral steps or do lateral movements during exercise? Everything is forward. You're on a treadmill, you're going forward. You're walking, doing the lunge, you're going forward. How many of you go to the side? The more people that I see raise their hand, the better. Because that's when, as we age and we don't do things like step to the side, stepping to the side is what's going to help us get to the ground faster. Because <laughs> you won't have the muscles to hold you up. And what sport does not have a, this is what I call a side lunge. What sport doesn't use that movement? Anybody? Golf? Well, I mean, if you have to get something off the ground, to pick, if you can put the ball in the hole, you got to get it out of the hole. So that, that's, that's in golf. But in sports, you know, you have to be able to move laterally or someone's going to get right past you. Tennis, football, hmm? What's not a sport? Yeah, most of the sports. And daily life, let's say you're walking down the sidewalk and you stumble and you do that. Your leg's strong enough to hold you. If it's not and you stumble, you're going into the road. You know, if you can't control your leg from going too far over, you've got to take another step or you're going down. So that's the daily things that you have to do. So, now, exercise has so many good things about it. I, I covered a lot of things. I got a lot of people in here smiling, right? It, may, you know, it will help you smile. It'll help you look better. It'll help you feel better. It'll help you live longer. Those, I mean, is there anything more you would want out of something? It doesn't just add years to your life, it adds life to the years. And that's what we're here for, right? Yes. How many people take medicine for your MS? Okay. If it's available to you, take it because it's available to you. Your doctor's not telling you to take it because it's uh, not going to help you out. You want to do what's best for you. I do it. I, I give myself my medicine every day and I stick with it. But it's not just that. I got to give my, myself the best chance of letting the, the medicine work. So I'm active, I eat well, I eat healthy. I'm trying to be happy all the time. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. I get angry sometimes. If I told you I didn't, then I'd be lying. But most of the time I'm a happy guy, I'm a helpful guy. I get off on seeing other people succeed. That makes my life and what I do successful. That's how I measure my success is how people around me are. So if I'm not having a successful day, I come here and I make everybody laugh, right? And I'm going to ask you guys all to do one thing before I get to the next thing. I want everybody to look at the person next to them on your right and whisper these words to them. This guy was great. <laughs> <laughs> now, if any of you said it, at least I can go home and say, I heard everybody saying I was great. <laughs> Okay, I got the bands covered. Oh, wait a second. When you think of exercise, what do you think about when you're at the gym? Big exercise equipment, weights, all that kind of stuff. I got some weights here. Can somebody help me? <laughs> no. This is 30 pounds. It adjusts to 5 to 30 pounds. And... Um, I, I just didn't turn it to the five. I'll turn it to the five and show you that. If you can hold on to something without dropping it, or if you're, or if, or, you know, if you're the kind of person that does drop things, this is not for you, okay? But it is, it is, you know, dumbbells have been around for a long time, and they're helpful. You can do all the different exercises with them. They help with your stability. If you do them standing, even better if you can stand and do them. If you can't, you sit down. If you can do them on a stability ball, you sit on a stability ball. And if not, you do it in a chair. Very simple. And if your hands cannot hold on to this, you go to the bands. Now, the thing about these bands, I'm, I'm, I'm going everywhere with this, but I, I don't want to leave this out. It's progressive resistance. 
it's on a horizontal plane, not vertical like weights. So if you let go, it's not going to land on your foot or on your head. So that's what brings safety to this. If you cannot hold on to this, then you got to find a way. What can I do? Because if some people have the ability to move their arms but not use their hands. It doesn't mean you can't use your arms. It just means you've got to find a way to get that in your hand or on your arm so you can do the exercise. Anybody confused? Okay, good. Aha, the hook. This is for powerlifting. I'm not asking that anybody in here become a powerlifter unless it's what you want. I found this to help a client that couldn't grasp with their hands. This can hold about 500 pounds. So if you're going to be lifting 500 pounds, you probably don't need me. <laughs> See, it hooks on to something like this. So if you can't use your hands, let's see how this holds up. I can take a, a make this into a stair wellness program. Come on, nobody laughed at that. Okay. If you can't hold it, but you can use your arms, I can wave at you while I'm doing this. Uh, you can do those. You can do these. Uh, and, you, and this is the lightest band. It goes up to the heaviest band. You could do this with some dumbbells. I wouldn't suggest it unless you're doing something like a shrug. Which would be that. See? But there's something that comes up in an exercise program that people don't think about, and sometimes they end up giving up because they don't have this in their mind. It's called modification. You've got to modify to what your abilities are, right? There's things that people want to do, right? There's things that people are able to do, but they mean nothing without the will to do it. So if you're not willing to do it, find a way. Just find a way, because it's always going to get you further than looking for an excuse. Now for people this is something that when I saw this the first time all I could think of is wow there's so many kids playing video games that are obese that just play video games, strong thumbs, weak everything else. They need one of these to hook up to the video game, ride it, so then if they're riding it, it powers the video game. Right? They'd find a way to probably figure out a computer program that would stop that, but that would be great. But this is something, it's an exercise bike, a, a mobile ergometer, I guess. You can do it with your arms, you can do it with your feet, you can put it on a table. And if you can't do this, you can plug it in and it does it for you. So you're still getting the movement with your legs. And if your legs get tired, you can plug it in or you can turn the switch on and it'll help you through it. These are, it's great, especially uh, for somebody who's not doing it because they think there's nothing there for them to do. I mean, there's, if you want it bad enough, you find a way to do it. Now, this is some, these are some other, I guess, kind of toys, kind of not. They're um, unstable surface. Not that the ground doesn't feel unstable enough as it is, right? Um, this is uh, an AirX pad. It, anybody want to volunteer come up here that can stand on the ground OK? This is an AirX pad. It's just something that I use. It's, it, I use it with balance. If you, can, if you have any problem standing on the ground without this, you don't. I don't want you to come up and do it. I would work with you to progress you into doing something like this. Any volunteers? Okay. Been a long time. <laughs> now, do you are you do you give consent to come up and be on video? Are you giving? 
You sure? Okay. I just have to ask you that. All right. What I want you to do first is, let me move this away. Have a seat. Okay. I want you to do two, I want you to stand up just twice. I just, just want to see your abilities. Stand, sit. Okay. Now, do you, you do exercise? Okay. I want you to hold my hand. All right. Now I want you to stand on this. And remember, this is, I, I consider this somewhat toy. It's not easy, is it? No, it ain't. Now, for you, what I, what I, was, what I was saying, I would have, this is a good example of why I wouldn't do this with somebody who has any gait issues right off the bat. Yeah. Because it's not easy, right? Yeah. Now, what, hold, hold both hands. I want you to try to squat right now. Just, to, just about five inches. Oh, don't step off of it. Just up and go up. You see? That's something I could have somebody do who's able to do that without shaking or anything on the ground. But I give you, I give you a big, you know, pat on the back because, yeah. because you got up here and look at all the people who didn't. Yo, thank right. you. Thank you over there. All right, I'm going to help you down. I got it. You got, you got it. I know there's just a lot of stuff up here that... And exercise is something that I myself have believed in my whole life. Not as exercise, as fun. I'll tell you a quick, quick story about being a participant versus being a spectator. But when I was a young child, I was the youngest one in my neighborhood. Everybody else in the neighborhood would play when I had to sit and watch. I was six, seven years old. That's when the light went off in my head. You got to find a way to do what you like. If doing what you like is playing with them, it's not up to them to tell you no. It's up to you to say, yeah, I want to do it. And I sat in my room for, I can't even tell you how long, watching them ride their bikes outside my window, watching them do stuff, watching them build ramps. I sat out there and watched them build a ramp 15 feet from my window, but they weren't riding their bikes and jumping it. And that was when I had the golden opportunity. I ran outside, I got on my bike so fast, I ran up, I, I, got, I rode, jumped the ramp, I landed, and you know what happened? Everybody looked at me like this. <gasps> you did it before we made it higher. We weren't done. That's what they said. <laughs> so they did. So they made it higher, and I jumped it. And they made it higher and higher and higher until it was so high that it, it couldn't get any higher and no one else would do it. And then somebody else jumped the ramp, and they were nowhere near as good as I was. Because I was practicing, and that's where I got my work ethic was if I didn't do that, I was stuck in the room watching. I was going to be a spectator. I wanted to be a participant. It led me all the way till today. There's times in my life that I can't, and I'm unable to, and I have to do something different or take a step back and rest. I keep the closest and best people in my life closest to me because I need them as much as they need me. I need my clients as much as my clients need me. It, nothing makes me happier than seeing someone else succeed that may or may not have been from me. I don't take the credit because when I'm working with people, I don't do the work. I spot, sometimes I'll do this stuff with them, but they do the work, they get the results, they're happy, and if they talk about me, I know it's gonna be good, and my career goes on. So that's, that's a lesson to all of you. It's okay to watch football on Sundays and Saturdays on television because I don't think any of you would wanna get into the game. That's not something that you'd want. You know, you'd bang your head, all that stuff, forget it. But when it comes to having children, grandchildren, friends, do more. It's my challenge to everybody in here is do something more. If you don't exercise, put it in your pad. If you keep a planner, how many of you keep planners? Okay, put a spot for exercise five times every day in that planner. As you get to the times that you don't do it, so you cross them off as long as you're going to do it. But you cannot say you didn't plan on it, because that's how it goes for everything. If you don't plan it, you're less likely to do it at a worse uh, level. You know, it's like eating. We talked about nutrition earlier, right? I was in and out of that talk, and weight loss, and, and all those different things. How many of you eat and don't plan to eat and end up eating more? If you plan what you're going to eat today, yesterday, 
you'll already have it planned out. You won't find yourself in the drive-thru at McDonald's ordering everything on the menu because you got something in a cooler or you already made the plan to do it. That's how you do it. When it comes to exercise, you plan. If you have fatigue problems, exercise helps fatigue. Don't plan your exercise around the time, during the times that you're fatigued. Plan them when you're not fatigued. It seems pretty simple, right? But when it comes time to exercise and you're too tired and you passed up on it, you missed out. So do it. And this is something that comes from a famous philosopher of the 20th century, which stated, there's do and there's not do, but there's no try. Anybody know who that is? Yoda. Yoda. You know what? I think Yoda owns Nike because Yoda came out with just do it, right? So why not just do it? Don't talk about it. Don't say it. Just do it. And then tell me about it because I want to know. All right? There's a lot more to exercises. I could talk about this for days. But I'm going to leave this to the Q&A. You guys can ask me the questions. You can send questions in and I will answer them. But I am so happy that I had the opportunity to talk to all of you because I see a lot of happy faces. And if I inspired you or if you feel like you're more likely to do something today than you were yesterday, do it. Don't wait for that window of opportunity and drive to end. Start it. Okay? Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff must be tired because there is no Q&A. <laughs> Jeff, I want to give you a certificate of appreciation. I want to thank Jeff and all of our speakers. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming. This was a great audience. It was our best symposium we've done to date. And I, again, thank you all for coming, okay? Remember, please, your evaluations. Oh, yeah, I know. You're waiting for that last tablet. Okay, I remember now. Let me go grab that. Wow. Please remember that we need your evaluations. We need to know how Jeff did today or any of our other speakers, okay? I heard you all say you liked it already, though. And again, I want to thank our sponsors, all that were here today, as well as the MS Views and News staff volunteers, family members, everybody that's out here, thank you for coming. And now, our last pick of the day. I'm gonna close my eyes, but then I can't read the number. We need more grant money for that. The last number of the day is three three nine 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 eight. Thank you again, everybody, and drive safely and have a great weekend.